Good now, everybody, and welcome to the Rise Up Morning Show. This is your place for helpful news, commentary, and answers to your crypto questions. My name is Evan. I've even got the mug with an E on it today. Traded the Rise Up Morning Show in for one with my initials. It's it, it's something. It, it's not home, but that's the state of the markets these days. We're in choppy waters. We're sailing out at sea, and one day... We'll return to those golden shores. But until that time, my friends, if you want to learn cryptocurrency, if you want to learn about blockchain, you want to build community, you want to stay safe and have a fun time doing it, this is the place for you. We're live every Monday through Thursday, and you can catch us here only on TikTok. Or if you're watching in the future, then you're catching us on YouTube. It's the best place to be. The best way to learn is to join a community to accelerate your learning journey. I see some folks joining Mr. Pat. Welcome. Everybody, let me know where you're tuning in from. Barry Doge, good to see you again. What you're thinking about as we enter this week. Just Tuesday, and uh, already it's been a big day in markets, changing interest rates in Japan have caused a pretty big collapse in crypto, in stocks. People are speculating. People are concerned. And I would say rightfully so. It's good to be concerned. It's good to pay attention. But if you're feeling worried or you're feeling good, you're in the right place. Let me know what you're thinking, how you're feeling about it, and we'll get caught up. Alex is going to be here in just a bit. Will's going to be here after him, and we'll be happy to answer your crypto questions. There he is, Alex Popovich, Mr. Rainy Night in Georgia. How you doing, brother? Good, dude. Good, man. I'm glad to hear it. How about that conversation with uh, Hussar and Tommy yesterday? Wasn't that just great? That was a good one. Yeah. There are a lot of good conversations happening across the uh, social media sphere. Ken jumped in. I loved that. Yeah, that was a good group of people that I don't think have ever probably been on a live together. I know, right? I I uh, I just am so happy for um, the responsibility that Hussar's gotten as his platform has grown. I can remember probably right around the time we were getting kicked off with Faceless when he was creating content i think he was kind of trying to find his niche he was talking a lot more about cryptocurrency we had a conversation on a live once him and me and he was feeling kind of down i think he had like thirty thousand followers which is you know a respectable platform of people who know like and trust you but he was really down he was like man my my channel is just not growing and i don't know if people like what i'm talking about or if it's helping them i said listen man i said don't don't worry i said you're you're doing great and it's only a matter of time if you keep doing what you're doing that that people will will find you and people have found him so there you go now he's talking to politicians and hopefully having the influence he wants on the world yes yeah, certainly he certainly found his stride that's right <clears throat> and here comes will <clears throat> there he is good morning will how you guys doing man doing good how you doing brother I'm good. I'm good. My apartment is being cleaned for the first time by my robot. And so for the past three minutes, I was just walking around. His name's Cody. I'm going to go, Cody, yeah, do you like that? Do you, how do you like this room, Cody? So I've been having a, sorry, I'm late. <laughs> no, man, you're, yeah. you're right on time. You're right no, on excuse. time. Yeah. Homeless in a tent, but you have a smartphone. DC Cowboy, you're always here. You're always here, DC Cowboy. <laughs> DC Cowboy, and you know I'm I, I'm always inviting you. I say it to DC Cowboy every time I see that. If you're listening, DC Cowboy, send me a DM, man. And you never do. I wish you would send me a DM. And speaking of DMs, we're never going to DM you. We forgot to say this yesterday, but it's always worth noting that these are our only accounts. So if you're trying to reach us on social media, you might have somebody who looks like us reach out to you. They might say, hey, bro, or they might say, do you want to invest in a good opportunity? Or they might say, uh, I have a group of professional traders or something. There's some free Bitcoin waiting for you. All of it is fake. None how's of it is true. You know, yeah, I just wanted to go too? back to I am a Nigerian prince who has been ousted from my country. I want them yeah. to go back to that. The good old days, man. Yeah. I think, Evan, I'm pretty sure you and I had this conversation when it happened, but uh, I have one time in my life seen the Nigerian prince uh, scam attempted and Christina got the email and it was incredible. It was everything that you wanted it to be. Um, there was even the yeah. phrase like, uh, you may be concerned, but but don't fear this is a legitimate business offer or something like that. It's like nothing puts me at ease more than I wonder who the first guy was. Business offer. 
Who do you think the first guy was to do that? And just how, uh, like, an big absolute genius. The, the thing is, is, like, he must have been immensely successful with that to the point where it got copied. Like, the first person who did the Nigerian <laughs> Prince email scam must have made a killing for everybody to be like, we all have to do this. Oh, absolutely. People, in, people in other countries are like, oh, dang, I could be a prince, too. Mm -hmm. um, someone just asked, DL, our friend, what's the easiest way to get my coin on a DEX? And DL, uh, in case you didn't see the comment, what is the network that your token lives on? Because different DEXs have different rules for the kinds of tokens that they'll accept. Some DEXs, um, you got to pay a fee. Some DEXs, you have to have a coin that's been alive for a certain amount of time or has a certain amount of liquidity. And it, it's all a little bit different, but the guidelines should be posted on their website. Do um, you guys have anything to add until we get more information? Just, you know, in a, in a nutshell, uh, you need a hot wallet, a software wallet, uh, more than likely, that can connect to the DEX in question. There's a lot of different DEXs. So it would, like, like Evan said, you kind of have to work backwards. It would depend what you're looking for. So if you wanted to trade some Solana stuff, for example, you might want to use Jupiter or Radium or one of those Solana DEXs. I think, what, Orca is another one? Orca. And, okay, so now we've determined which network the DEX we want to use is on because, you know, we want to do some Solana stuff. So we have to get a Solana wallet and then we would have to send Solana to that wallet. So you might download Phantom and create a Phantom wallet. And then you might send some Sol from your Coinbase account, your Kraken account, or whatever your preferred method of on-ramp is. I think you can actually even on-ramp directly in Phantom through something like MoonPay. Um, yeah, we need, we need a little more information to be more specific. Otherwise, that's kind of the general, the general I'll frame. I'll tell you, the absolute fastest, easiest way that I have personally seen to get your token listed on a reputable DEX is through Warpcast. There is a profile there uh, called MetalBot. I believe the profile and the channel are Metal-Bot. I think the website is Metal.Bot. We can confirm that if you're in the Discord DL, we can you know send you links and stuff. But what they've done is in your social feed, you can go to a post by MetalBot, click a few buttons to set the name of your token, the supply of your token, the ticker, and then click I'll to launch it. Yeah, you can make one, and it immediately goes, get this, to Uniswap. It's a token that will live on the base network, and anybody anywhere can trade it and start adding liquidity on Uniswap, which is, you know, for my money, probably the most reputable decentralized exchange platform. It's certainly the biggest. Um, It'd so also be that, the best place. Important. Yeah, it'd probably be the best place where you could find success with that too, because with Uniswap being the biggest decks, the most liquidity is there, most eyeballs are on it. So, you know, all good things. Can I send you money, DL says. Do you mean to do this for you? No, no. I mean, you could hire us to do it for you. You could send us money because you love us and want to support the show. All those are viable options. But I'm telling you, man, this is the, this is easy enough to do it yourself. And hop in the Discord. Send us a message if you have trouble getting in. The link is at the Rise Up Morning Show. Dot com. I, I can make a, a quick video about this. I think I made a video about MetalBot. I'll be glad to tag you in it if I didn't, but it's definitely something that is worth trying yourself first. The risk is so low. You, you don't really have to spend any money. And it's the kind of thing that if you wanted to launch a token, you would not want to pay someone else to do it for you, especially your first time, unless you were like working with them to watch and learn, because you need control of that token. You, you, just like buying and selling your crypto, you need to learn how to move the money. You, you got to kind of learn how that stuff works. It's not too hard for you. I promise. Will, I just, what, what's that? I just wanted to highlight how I have been watching you talk, Evan, but I'm also looking at my plant Federico in the background being like, man, I should have named Federico Evan because their flow is just uh, un, unmatched, unparalleled. This, this I'm telling you what, Federico okay. is showing out, dude. Got the locks. And Federico the loves it. Federico's an outdoor plant now. Federico's been indoor for two years and now here he is. Anyway, sorry. No, Fred Sorry Rico's to derail the conversation. Going to be flourishing. Going to be flourishing. That's a nice little porch you got there. Is it rare to have a porch in Boston? Super rare. Um, they don't really exist in almost anywhere. You can insert, like, on, in the middle of the city, you can find, like, rooftops on place, but they're typically, like, communal for the buildings. Mm -hmm. um, 
it, an outdoor balcony patio area is super, super rare. Uh, not in many parts of the city. But uh, my girlfriend and I found one, and now we have it, and it's nice. I was going to say, I back in 2014, when I lived in Boston, and, well, I didn't, I guess I lived in Chelsea, technically. I don't know, is that considered Boston still? It was pretty close to downtown. No, we call it Chelsea Salvador. <laughs> well, it was... <laughs> It was right over the bridge, and yeah. I was a uh, I was a lowly a lowly E three on E three pay, and uh, I managed to find a studio apartment. It did have a porch. It was very nice. It was it was for all things a very nice apartment, brand new building. Um, but that single studio apartment was probably the size grand total of like my little dining room and kitchen area right here. And it was like two grand a month, 1900 and change a month. And that was in 2014. Oh, I can't imagine how much it is now. I, I shudder to think, um, but I, I do, I do remember. Yeah. Every, everything was in Spanish in Chelsea. Um, yeah. I, the food's I, amazing. For the, if, Cause the thing is, is Latin food in Boston is awful everywhere, except for in East Boston and in Chelsea. Mm -hmm. It's the only place. Cause um, I live in East Boston now. And you actually have like a very, very sizable um, El Salvadorian, Guatemalan, uh, Brazilian, and Mexican population here, along with oh. Italian. And uh, there's some there's some real good food here. So, Will, just for my frame of reference, because it's been it's been a while. My my points that like I remember in in Boston, the Union Oyster House sign is oh yeah is yeah. a landmark that I recall yeah. very vividly. Um, try, I'm trying to think of what else I, I the do. The oldest I'm, running oyster house in America. It was good. I, 10 out of 10 recommend. Um, you know, you know what my favorite, my single favorite thing about Boston is though, it had nothing to do with the city itself. It was this one guy. So the Coast Guard base is on the Harbor, obviously. And we have this kind of great view of the whole thing. So like, I'm looking, if I walk down our pier, I look over to the left and there's old iron sides almost every single day just parked right there. And then like uh, like I was saying, I lived in Chelsea on the other side of the harbor. And in the morning, you would see the morning commute and there was this guy, this absolute legend that we would wait on the ship for and wave to every morning who would drive to work on a boat, like a little tiny dinghy with a little stand up motor in a full, full suit. <laughs> Jacket, tie, shoes, briefcase in one hand, motor in the other, and he so would just smart. he would just jet across the the harbor every day. His boat was probably, I mean, it was a miracle that that thing, like I never saw it capsized, but incredible. He was an absolute legend. Every yeah, that morning. guy was doing the commute smart. Oh yeah. Oh dude. Yeah. And on a budget. <laughs> and not to mention that after the commute, you knew that guy was winning. Like Alex on the commute home. Was he just like loosening his tie and like taking his shirt off and like throwing a fishing pole in the water? Oh my god! I almost never got to see him on the way home, but every morning he would go by, and we would all stand on the ship and just <laughs> salute. He, he was uh, he got a kick out of it every day. I'm um, sure he thinks of that every day for the rest of his life, being like, "That was like this is the coolest shit. This is the greatest right. way to go go off to work." <laughs> well, because the navy the navy base is right across the harbor too, so like we're all yeah. out there. Everyone's out there. Um, hey guys, can I, can I, we, we had a couple other good questions come in, but before we get, uh, to questions, can I tease, uh, something to come and, and tell the folks, um, yes. uh, guys, gals, monsters, machines. We always say that the rise up morning show is not sponsored by this or that, but it should be. And finally, somebody heard the call. They saw the light and we've got our first official corporate sponsor. And I'm excited to tell you about it. You're going to hear more about it later. You're going to hear a little more about it this week. Um, this is something you can go try for yourself right now. We just started using it. It's a lot of fun. Um, you don't have to use it is the best part. And it's the kind of thing that is not just a token. That's the only way to interact with it. We're talking about um, Banana Gun. So shout out to the folks at Banana Gun who, first of all, have a killer name. And second of all, have built a really cool trading bot because, you know, 
the last couple months, Telegram bots have been all the rage. If you're trading, especially somewhere like the meme coin casino where seconds and slippage really matter and you want to make the most of your time in your trades and also like not spend a bajillion trillion years trying to learn, you need a Telegram bot. It's like text messaging to execute your trades. And we're going to get into it later. We'll do some videos on it. We will uh, show you how to use it and we'll have a little contest that I'll tease later in the show. But right now, the thing you need to know is if you want to check it out, you can just do a Google search for banana gun or even better, head to the Discord. We've got a referral link in our profile so that we all of us uh, can make an impact as a community on their platform, the more that we can get folks to sign up for it, you know, because it is a sponsorship, um, the more they'll say, wow, this is a great opportunity. We should continue to partner with the Rise Up Morning Show. Even if you don't spend any money, it's totally free to sign up. You don't have to execute any trades. It is a great way to learn about the kind of tools that people are building in our space to improve user experience and also do practical things. So check it out. It's in the Discord. Alex posted an announcement. Um, you can also just search for banana gun when you get there. Um, or if you need the link, send us a DM and we can send it to you. Um, was that on your bingo card today, Alex, was to walk through it? Or um, are we just talking a little about it today and sharing? I, and what yeah. Do you think? I, so like Evan said, we're going we're gonna to film a longer format video where we walk through all of this stuff. Um, how to use it and whatever. I'm still doing some messing around with it. So far, it's very nice. Uh, I think they did a. I think they did about as good a job as you can do setting up a wallet, or excuse me, a bot inside of Telegram. Um, and they are actually moving the thing. I think. I think the Telegram bot will stay and and keep doing its thing, but they're moving it to a web app, which is pretty exciting. They're essentially turning it into a Dex, um, but with Telegram trading bot functionality. Uh, and actually, just yesterday, there was a tweet from some uh, one of the other uh, people that they sponsored, who was demonstrating the copy trade feature where you can like put in someone's wallet, and you can just have set your bot to execute the same trades that they do. Um, and the person that they were copy trading, actually, they front ran that person's trade using the bot, which is <laughs> that's brilliant. The bot recognized the transaction came through. And since that person wasn't using one of these bots, they ended up getting front run because the banana gun bot cleared before whatever they were doing cleared. Wow. Which is hysterical. Yeah, I got I got to play around with, with banana gun this week. They're so cool. Evan, Evan and I did a lot with bonk bot when we were doing like our you know, meme coin safety courses and stuff, which I definitely want to talk about more. It's been a little while since we've covered all of those kind of basics and stuff. Um, but so far, this one just kind of has some different features. I didn't even really know that there was a thing. There's like more or that they were all different. Um, but this one's just really fast. Uh, it has, like I said, the copy trading thing. You can do limit buys and sells, which is kind of neat. Um, and there's a couple other things, but I haven't messed around with with all the features yet. So we'll uh, we'll keep you guys posted. Yeah, this is the interface right here. I'm I'm sorry I can't get close. Awesome. The one the one bad thing about this new phone <laughs> is that when I try to get really close, uh, it gets blurry. So uh, pardon me, but you've got simple interface to give you kind of every little feature: auto sniper, copy trading, pending snipes. You can see your pending orders, your positions. You can do a manual buy, and it's as simple as. Uh, copying and pasting a contract address and sending a message. And it will say, what do you want to do? How much do you want to buy? It's got um, public and private keys. So you can send it funds that it can, you know, spend for you when you permit it to. It's a lot faster than uh, waiting for a transaction to pop up, clicking approve to sign. And you can change all these different settings like the price impact, slippage, your gas settings, how much you're willing to pay for gas. And of course, you can use different kind of presets too. They even have this uh, button that I haven't clicked yet, which has a little Amer American flag to Chinese flag. You can translate it. They support different different languages. So uh, if you're not in the United States, this can work for you too. And we definitely, like Alex said, we'll get into it. Um, I have to play around with it more. I just sent it a little um, a little, a little cash to, to start playing around. They were on Ethereum, which is where they got most of their like experience, traction, action, and volume. And then they were like, no, the party's on Solana. So that's why they're reaching out to more people for sponsorships. And we said, oh, you want people to talk about it in a helpful way that won't get you arrested? Call us. 
So shout out to Alex for making the relationship work and uh, stay tuned for more of that. If you have a company that you know, a product you like, you trust, um, it doesn't even have to be a sponsorship. We would love to build more authentic relationships with people in our space to help tell a better story by representing products that actually bring value to people's lives. Um, the last thing I'll say about it is uh, we're going to do a little contest. Um, the official details were kind of, you know, hammered out uh, in about 30 seconds between me and Alex in a DM last night. We're so we're, making it, we go. this. Yeah. Huh? we're making it up as we go. Okay? We're making it up as we go. But we just thought, you know, again, we want to make a big splash. We want to thank him for being a sponsor and we want to make it worth it for you guys. So um, if you use the referral link to sign up, We'll open a channel in the Discord. This is coming. This is just, you know, stay tuned for this and post a little picture of your, you know, hey, I signed up. I'm in Banana Bot kind of thing. Post a screenshot to the channel. We will add you to a drawing and one person will win uh, 50 bucks in Solana that they can start using to trade on the platform. So totally free and clear money to go gamble in the meme coin casino with, have a little fun with, and then uh, definitely stay tuned in the future for um, another live class coming. We'll do a live class in addition to the YouTube videos so that we can maybe, uh, it might be time to do that meme coin casino class. So you can stay safe and have fun in the meme coin casino sure. before you go gamble all your money. Yeah, like, definitely. When I opened up the DMs today and I saw like all the plans and things that you guys were talking about, I was like, oh, oh, sh oh sh Alex and Evan have been cooking. <laughs> they've, been, they've been cooking. What's happening? <laughs> well, we're all cooking now. And uh, that's why we got to have a stand up. Uh, so, you know, stay tuned. The Rise Up Morning Show is taking off. And uh, I, I don't know if we, we, we don't have anything, uh, no proof in the pudding yet, but we've also been um, spending time around Warpcast on social media and in meetings, building relationships with our friends at Coinbase. Um, Alex teased a while ago that we hope to have Jesse Pollock on the show. Um, but hopefully, um, in the not too distant future, as we continue to talk about on Chain Summer, Warpcast, Farcaster, Frames, Base, we'll be able to say, that we have a relationship with them too. So stay tuned. Yep. Stuff. <laughs> yeah, last last note I'll leave is that, like Evan said, if you're just if you're just tuning in, this is the first time that we've officially been sponsored, meaning that someone actually paid us money to do something on the show, which is pretty sweet. Uh, I was just uh, recollecting Evan that you and I have been doing this show. At, at, I almost want to say at least weekly. We've missed a week here and there, but for about 20 months now, um, straight. Started on Twitter with Evan and I hosting Twitter spaces to two or three people, mostly Neil. Shout out, Neil. Love being, it. I, I, I will never, I will truly never forget the one time Evan and I did a show to Neil. Just for me. <laughs> to Neil. <laughs> it, was, it was exclusively Neil. Me and Evan did the whole thing. Neil. But if you listen to the recording, even though we did talk to Neil a lot, if you listen to that recording, I, it's still, you know, good oh, yeah. now revolutionaries. Like there's a whole theater full of people. You and I just, you know, chatting about crypto, like we're talking to the whole damn market. You'd never know. It is good. I'm I'm very I'm very excited about it. So it's it was and we've never we've never made a penny from doing the show in twenty months. So here in month twenty we get we get paid for the first time, which is really, really exciting because I love a way that we can earn some money for doing this that doesn't have to come from you guys. That's the best kind. Uh, and just like I said, so just so we're all abundantly clear, uh, there is no product to buy here. It's a service to use. We get we got paid to do the the feature that we're talking about right now um, for two weeks. So we'll have another feature next week. We'll kind of talk about it on and off. If you guys in the meantime have questions, we do also have a direct line uh, to the team. So if you have questions about it, like, I don't know, any, literally anything, I don't care. Any concerns, Feature suggestions. Any, any questions, yeah. Things that maybe you try it out and there's like something that doesn't work that great. Uh, let us know, I will forward it to them and we will get an answer. I'm unclear whether or not we're gonna get someone from the team to do the show yet. Um, but I did throw that out there as something that I really wanted to do. Um, but they're in like full marketing mode right now because they just launched the Solana side of the house. So um, I expect that as the campaign kind of develops because it's cut up into phases. So phase one is this, you know, like get everyone to uh, download it, give it a try. <clears throat> if you use our link as well, uh, they send us a percentage of the fees, the trading fees that you incur while using it through our link, which is kind of nice. Um, 
<clears throat> it's Solana gas, so you know it's it's small, but uh, it's still cool. Yeah. And uh, and yes, we will. We are going to do um, Jillian. We're going to do a, a YouTube format, like longer form video, where Evan and I sit down and have the big screen share pulled up with with this right there on it, and we'll do the full the full walkthrough and stuff. <laughs> Um, so if you guys like set it up and then don't even touch it again until that video comes out, I think we're hoping to film it on Thursday and then we'll do our best to get it edited and, and posted, um, you know, by the end of the weekend or something like that. And then next week we can talk about it again. So very exciting. Um, yeah, and, sorry, sorry to break away for a commercial, but you know, we're, we're just thrilled. But for the, for, for what it's worth, we would not have even gotten the opportunity without all of you guys hanging out with us every day and hanging out and watching the show and asking questions and engaging uh part of the reason that we were considered um over even some influencers with significantly larger followings was because of the engagement and the fact that this is a live show which they don't have anyone else doing right now um so that's pretty exciting and we are we're hope we're hoping to turn this into a longer longer term partnership so we'll see anyway yeah we can uh, yeah but i, I do i do just want to add on to that as a, as a thank you from, from me to both you, Alex, and Evan, for letting me join uh, and hop on your backs as you guys built this over the past 20 months from zero. Just being like, hey, well, do you want to hop on here? And then just I was like, oh, yeah, sure, that sounds great. I like talking about this stuff. And then just timing it perfectly for me to be able to, to jump on at the perfect time and take advantage of all your hard work. So thanks, guys. <laughs> when preparation meets opportunity, my friend. Oh. And we're glad you're here. So so let me bring it back then because we're getting some comments. Yeah. Let, let me ask you, thank you for all the support. Check out Banana Gun. Use the referral link. It's in our Discord server. We'll talk about it more and we'll share the details of the contest. You don't have to spend any money, yada, yada, yada. We'll, we'll, we'll give you a commercial again at the end of the show. But for now, we know you want to hear about the market. We had somebody ask about uh, what do you think about the future of DeFi? We had the Chog ask, uh, have you seen this bull flag? And in the interim between yesterday's show are live with Hussar. Uh, thanks to the folks who caught us there. If you're joining us for the first time, like I see some of you are welcome. We do this every Monday through Thursday from 7 a.m. Central Standard Time to about 8.30, 9. Um, and a lot of folks are kind of speculating about what's happening. I've seen a lot of tears, Will, uh, about some of the sacrifices you've made. I see a lot of questions about the future of the market. So we've had a couple of hours and we've gotten some more data points. Let us know in the comments if you maybe need a synopsis, if you have a particular question, but I, I just thought I'd kick it over to you guys and you know, that, that's what you're here for because we want to hear from you. Um, how are you feeling about everything and uh, what should folks at home be thinking about? We'll take it away. I'm sure I was about to say, I have a lot of thoughts. Also, is the sound coming in here echoey? Uh, very, very slightly, but not in, in a pleasing yeah. way. Like you're, yeah. like you're, you know, acoustically rich. A little, little ASMR. You know, we're gonna, we're gonna, this, these numbers are about to jump through the roof. Um, so yeah. Anyway, uh, apologies for a little bit of echo. I'm still setting up this room. But anyway, I have a lot of thoughts on the market, um, and I'll give a bull case and I'll give a bear case. If any of you have been following me, you know that I took a huge, massive position of my altcoins and put them into stable coins. Um, or cash. Um, and so the, the main thing that I'm worried about right now, and, and I sold it like near the, the recent local bottom. And I wanted to do that because I think the bottom could potentially bottom <laughs> more. Um, and here's what I'm worried about. So uh, all the reasons that we or you guys have potentially heard about online about why the market has tanked over the past number of days, we have um, war escalation in the Middle East, um, there is the Jap Japanese carry trade, uh, and there's the large increase in unemployment. Those are kind of like the three big things. Um, well, so can I give a, a literally 20 second on the Japanese thing? Because a lot of people have explained that. And I think that. Please go ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So obviously war escalation, we don't really need an, 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 an explanation there. Um, unemployment, not much explanation there other than unemployment was worse than what was forecast. It was forecast to be 4.1%. It's at 4.3%. That is not a huge unemployment number, but it is a cause of concern that it's now escalating at a, it's accelerating at a pace faster than what analysts were hoping for, right? Um, and that could get to like a scary recession number. A scary recession unemployment number is like 6% is bad. The 8 to 10% is 
you're you're in the pits of a recession. Okay, so now let's talk about the Japanese carry trade because that's the thing I'm the most worried about. So what had happened over the past year and a half is the U.S. federal government has been increasing interest rates. What that means is it means it makes it more expensive to borrow money in the United States, right? It makes it more expensive to borrow the dollar. However, for the past almost, I think, 13, 14 years, the Bank of Japan's interest rates have been a zero, which means you can borrow money for super low interest rates in Japan, and you can borrow the yen. Now, uh, a couple weeks ago, the Bank of Japan actually increased interest rates by 0.1%, I think is the number, a super, super, super small number. And the reason why they did that, the reason why they ended this period of low interest, of zero interest rate, is because the valuation of the yen has been cratering. Um, and so they need to try to fight to save their currency, otherwise the Japanese economy will be in worse straits. So they started to increase interest rates ever so slightly, and what that signaled to markets is that, oh, this arbitrage situation is over. And what the arbitrage situation was is very sophisticated investors could go to Japanese markets, could borrow the yen at basically zero interest, so essentially free money, and then invest it into international assets that provide maybe 7%, right? So you're making money for free. And that's the situation that has existed for the past year and a half. So what happened when the Bank of Japan increased interest rates slightly, it caused the US dollar's valuation against the yen to collapse um, because the yen is now perceived as it's slightly stronger now and it's going to get stronger because we're very worried that the Bank of Japan is going to continue to increase interest rates, which honestly is something they need to do, which um, what happened is as the US dollar collapsed, it caused a lot of what we call margin calls or liquidations in Japanese markets. So a ton of positions got absolutely wiped out. And when your liquidation position gets wiped out, you need to cover that position. So institutions across the world and Japanese institutions in particular, but also this includes Berkshire Hathaway, who is Warren Buffett's company. Warren Buffett sold um, half of all of the Apple stock that they have. It was a massive sell-off in order to cover their margin call, their positions that got liquidated in Japanese markets. Right. That's why we saw a huge sell off start on Thursday and Friday uh, across uh, stocks in, in the light. That's also probably why we've seen the Bitcoin ETF experience outflows in a pretty big way over the past two, I think, three days, two days at least. So that is what caused markets to really tank near the end of the week. And what I'm very, very worried about is that that isn't over yet because we don't know how much organizations and companies are going to need to cover. We don't know uh, if, if that's done yet. And what could happen is if the Bank of Japan is really serious about saving their currency, they should continue to increase interest rates, which will cause the US dollar's valuation against the yen to continue to slide, which will cause more liquidations of positions in Japanese markets, which will cause more institutions to sell international assets and cause international markets to fall further. And this can happen over the course of weeks to months, right? It's not like today and tomorrow. It's not like crypto where things happen, you know, like that. This is much, much slower. So we could see a rally right now. In fact, we could even see a rally in Bitcoin up to 62K. And then we get news that like, hey, Bank of Japan is increasing interest rates again. And we see the US dollar fall and that whole cascade of events happens all over again and we see the bottom bottom more. And so and so if it, in that in my opinion should happen if the Bank of Japan is really truly serious about trying to save the yen's valuation. Um, and then you have to ask yourself the question, okay, <clears throat> if that happens, let's say there's one more wave of that, maybe two more waves of that, right? It, it, you know, um, if the stock market, if the S&P 500 and the Nasdaq continue to fall because of that over time, what are the next dominoes to fall? Is that going to cause the largest Fortune 500 companies in the world to start to fire people and do layoffs? That could dramatically increase the unemployment number from 4.3% to the 8%, the 9%, the scary recession numbers for unemployment. And when people stop getting paychecks, shit hits the fan hard because credit cards are already maxed out. 
So if you have that happen, you're going to have markets sell off even more, not just because of the Japanese carry trade, but because unemployment is starting to skyrocket. Recession is here. Also, if you have war continue to escalate, that is also adding more uncertainty to the market. So we have this, this potential domino effect, but also we have all of these other events that have been happening in the world for, for a, three years, essentially, that are all kind of meshing together to create what I'm very worried about is like a ball and chain that's going to be attached to the leg of investors and sink people down. And this could take place over nine months. The 2008 recession, um, it took 14 months, I think, maybe it was 12 months to go from the top of the S&P 500 to the bottom of the 2008 recession, which capitulated once um, the largest banks got in trouble. I don't think it's really possible for the largest banks to get in trouble, but we've been talking about for a while, the medium-sized banks in the United States are at really high risk because they have incredibly large unrealized loss positions. And if the stock market starts collapsing, those unrealized loss positions are going to get dramatically worse. So that is the situation that I see potentially unfolding. And so the decision I made for myself, and you guys have to make the decision for you, is. I looked at that and I say, okay, I am incredibly over 12. 90% of my um, net worth was in crypto. And I go, this is too much exposure to crypto given the risk of this potentially happening. You know what, if we get a rally up to 62K, you know, my altcoin positions would have been up maybe 10, 15% more. Sure, like in, in the short term, like I, 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 I think that bounce could happen. I can play that, but do I feel comfortable leaving all of this at risk? And the answer to me was absolutely not. Um, so I needed to de-risk my own position. And I still have my Jupiter. That's just going to stake. I'm just going to leave that staking and it'll do what it's going to do. I still have all my Bitcoin. Um, and I have like two or three other small altcoin positions that I'll look to try to, try to get out of. But for me, I was like, the risk of this domino effect playing out is so scary that I cannot put 90% of my net worth at risk of experiencing that. So I'm going to wait to see strength in the market. So, but sorry, I went off on a tangent of what I'm looking at in the market and kind of how I'm playing it. But, um, you know, if, if, if Evan, Alex, I was looking at the chat. Were there any questions that kind of popped up in that? Guys, let me know if you have any questions, if any of that didn't make sense. Yeah, there's a lot of good conversation happening here. Um, and, and one of the things people want to know is how do we verify in real time these interest rates in other markets. Um, I don't have personally a good source. I usually am relying on secondhand reporting from what I would consider to be credible sources, sources that you know you would list their source. Do you have one? Um, source for what exactly? Uh, Japan's interest rate decisions in real time. Like you know how how we're, oh, we're always yeah. waiting for like um, the data reports to come out and there's a press release or whatever. Well, what you need to do is, is, I don't know what it is right now, I can Google it, but you would want to look up the next meeting or press release for the Bank of Japan. Because the Bank of Japan, just like the Fed, they have planned meetings where they come out and say, this is what we're going to do moving forward with interest rates. So what you'd want to do is you'd want to go and look up what the dates are for those, uh, not Fed meetings, those uh, BOJ meetings, Bank of Japan, that's the name of the federal bank. And then you would want to tune in to their press releases. That's how you would get the most up-to-date direct from the source information. Got it. Uh, Khalil said forexfactory.com. I did a quick Google search and saw that there are you know websites like investing.com or uh, tradingeconomics.com. I clicked into a couple of them um, that look like they report on these things secondhand and it's their business. Um, so they probably aren't going to jeopardize that model by posting something inaccurate. But another question that we have is this one sums it up well is people people are kind of uncertain about the direction people question not your decision to de-risk but just generally some people say it's going to go up some people say it's going to go down um i would be curious to hear you guys elaborate more on the kind of things you're looking at the the, the comment that we just got that's um kind of summarizes the confusion is why is crypto following the markets right now when it was supposed to be a hedge against them. I think there's generally a lot of confusion about like the relationship between assets, the four year cycle, you know, a lot of people say we're at the point in the cycle where I thought the bull run was supposed to continue. And we see that kind of question a lot. Um, so, so if you're, it, are we following any cycle to your eyes? Is there a pattern that people should be looking at here? For my money, the answer is really 
honestly know that there are data points you could look at that could inform your conviction, but that just like Will, you really need to have conviction in what you are investing in. Um, I said to someone today, I wouldn't go out and buy a gun unless I had learned how to shoot it, learned how to use it, um, and and taken the requisite courses. I would I would do that before I ever bought one. Um, I would know why I had it. And then if I didn't want it anymore, I would know how to get rid of it safely. I wouldn't just have it lying around my house. Um, I feel kind of the same about crypto. If you're looking at what is happening macroeconomically or what somebody's telling you and you're not able to get conviction about it, then maybe you need to spend more time uh, learning about the underlying asset. But I don't know. What, what would you guys say about the relationships? Because, Will, I feel like you have a lot more helpful indicators that you personally look to to build conviction. I'm, I'm kind of a fundamentals guy. Yeah, for for the conversation of the stock market and Bitcoin, um, we have seen over the past number of years way, way too much correlation between stocks and Bitcoin. Um, and then one thing I'll give him props for, DeFi Daddy pointed out to me, is that the summertime is the most uncorrelated that stocks and crypto are from one another. It's just been unfortunate that stocks kept going up and Bitcoin did the opposite. So, um, but for the most part, you know, the stock market and Bitcoin have been going in the same general direction that has been led by global liquidity levels. Now, right now, you can say that Bitcoin and stocks are perfectly tied to global liquidity because as global liquidity, which means the amount of money in the overall financial system has been increasing, and that is largely led by the Federal Bank of the United States, but also all central banks. You know, are they, are they printing money or are they not printing money? From 2008 up until really a year and a half ago when the Fed started decreasing interest rates, uh, it has been a period of massive increase in global liquidity, massive money printing. And so throughout all of Bitcoin's history, Bitcoin has existed in a time of, it's called quantitative uh, easing. That's the term for it, but it's a time where money is printing, money is flowing, liquidity is rising, there's more money available to borrow. There's more money available to invest in assets. So glo since global liquidity was doing this, stocks were doing this and Bitcoin was doing this. So you could say that crypto and stocks are very correlated to one another because they're very correlated to global liquidity because it just makes sense. If there's more money in the system, more money can flow into things. And then over the past year and a half, we saw money, um, the global liquidity start to decrease but we saw the ETF run in Bitcoin. The reason why that increased is because you had a new pipe of money, a very big pipe of money connect into Bitcoin and you saw that buck that trend, right? Buck the trend of global liquidity going down. And also the effects of global liquidity going down or up take time to be felt in the market. So we still have the stock market going up. And a lot of people, if we do have a recession, a lot of people are gonna look at this last run in stocks we've had over the past year as the melt up. A melt up is the final explosion of fun that you have before things fall like a rock in water. So those are my thoughts on the, the, the reason why Bitcoin and stocks have been tied to one another. What you're gonna see, and also it's, it was the same with, with gold too. Gold for the most part copied the stock market as well. It's just really a matter of how hard do things rebound depending on market factors. Gold rebounded super hard in 2008 because it fell 30% and then started flying. And it was because of two reasons. One, the gold ETF is still pretty new. Luckily, the, the Bitcoin ETF is still pretty new too. Um, and the markets, even though it had bottomed, people were still terrified of markets. So people ran to the asset to go to when you're scared, which historically has been gold. And so gold had a really, really amazing rebound for an asset as you know large as gold is. And I think Bitcoin could very likely be the same. But again, I don't think Bitcoin is going to be saved from a market collapse. There's no reason as to why it should. If gold and other store of value, safe haven assets fell, if Bitcoin is that same class, which it is, it should also fall. So Bitcoin fell or gold fell 30% in that recession. If we have the recessionary fall now, if, right, I'm not saying it's a guarantee, if, I would expect Bitcoin to fall along with stocks in perfect correlation because when people are afraid, they sell to preserve their capital and they run to cash. So that would happen with Bitcoin. But then you, people would start looking, okay, what do I run to now? I'm scared of the market. What are these assets you have? Like, oh, you're going to see gold rebound. But also Larry Fink for the past year has been on every single business news network telling everybody, 
I think Bitcoin is the asset you run to when you're scared. It's when you have fear that the global uh, economy is weak. You fear about geopolitical concerns. He has been pitching this for a year and laying the groundwork for his institutional investors to say and make them feel that Bitcoin is safe and that Bitcoin is what you run to. And so he has positioned himself almost like he knows this is going to happen. Almost uh, like he might have a product that people could buy. Yes. You know, <laughs> William. Mm -hmm. And he has positioned himself to end BlackRock to be that institutional vehicle for getting access to Bitcoin. And then I bet you see Bitcoin erupt in value, but not after potentially a 50% fall from where we are right now. And then afterwards, I bet you see Bitcoin perfectly, uh, I, I'm very off topic right now, but um, I, then you see, I bet you see Bitcoin do an amazing recovery, potentially for years, because that's what gold did, right? Um, and, and Evan, you mentioned something like, are we in this four year cycle? I thought this is when the bull run starts. I think we are potentially seeing the four year cycle break forever right now, because we, it's, you had the ETF run, you had an all time high before the, the halving. That was like a first potential signal. If we have a recession, a bear market's gonna happen immediately afterwards. The four year cycle's toast. It's, it's done, it's over if that happens. It's absolutely shattered. And now you have BlackRock positioning Bitcoin as the safe haven asset for the past year and a half to run to when we're scared and they're gonna dive into it. And I bet you see Bitcoin copy gold where it just runs. And when you have sell-offs in gold in that ETF, I'd have to pull up the chart, but it lasted for like four months. And then boom, 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 flying back upwards again. You know, this is potentially the end of the four-year cycle and potentially the last time we ever talk about it, unless Bitcoin and the markets get saved right now, you know, and if that happens, then this is a local bottom as we continue our way upwards through to the midpoint to end of 2025. Um, so it's an exciting time, but it's a very uncertain time, which is one of the reasons why I moved to stable coins. I'm going to add an opinion to that last point that you made, Will, about you know, potentially the, the cycle breaking. Cause I, I did the simplified Twitter space, which by the way, um, I'll put his handle down here in the chat in a second. If you guys are on Twitter and you want to follow some reasonable human being, uh, to help start to, you know, hear something that isn't insane coming out of crypto Twitter, uh, Sam Stefanina hosts multiple Twitter spaces a week and they're very good conversations and simplified is kind of the broader market. Uh, one and this came up a lot yesterday, obviously, and I made the observation that, in my humble opinion, the the four year cycle, the way that we've known it, is already broken. It's already gone for two reasons. Uh, one, because we saw, thanks to the ETFs coming out, a new all time high made pre having, which has never happened before. Uh, two, actually three points. Uh, point number two we saw massive altcoin rallies. Like I, I, if I had a dollar for every time someone said, when are the alts going to run while you could look at charts and find alts that were up two, three, four, five, six, seven hundred percent, um, a lot, a lot of dollars would be had. And the difference is that we started to finally see the cycle of a cryptocurrency's lifespan break in a way that it hasn't broken before, which is, uh, you know, the standard life cycle of an altcoin is phase one speculative hype. There is no other reason to trade it. There's no other reason to buy it. There is no other reason to hold it. And there's no other reason to sell it. It's exclusively a speculation lottery ticket. And then 99% of them don't make it past that stage. And we finally saw massive ones who didn't necessarily do anything wrong, like the way that most altcoins die, like with horrible treasury mismanagement or some sort of major security exploit or something like that. Um, we just saw them start to not do anything. Cardano, Polkadot, Cosmos, like huge, well-respected ecosystems just simply didn't do anything because demand wasn't there and there were actually users using stuff on different chains. So I would say that's another big way that the cycle's already broken. We didn't just see any blanket altcoins run just because they were altcoins, um, which was really interesting. And then I guess 
you know, two a little bit. Um, the the sentiment is just very different uh, around it. And of course, crypto is a young industry. People always yell at me when I say that because they think 15 years is a long time for an industry to exist. It's not. No. Uh, and there's a tremendous amount of economic, you know, geoeconomic world economic factors that crypto just hasn't experienced yet. So we're making brand new data points every single day. And everything that has happened this year from the pre having all time high, thanks to the ETF, to the ETF inflows, outflows, to the ETH ETF ramming through, um, all of these other different kinds of things, the way that, you know, like I said, these gigantic layer ones with no real, um, no real like obvious reason to just flounder have just not gone anywhere. All of these things are brand new data points that will be referenced uh, by market predictors forever from now on. Uh, these, these will all enter the conversation as things to consider. And for that reason, then, you know, well, like you said, you listed everything, um, but you had just the ultimate collision of a bunch of different stuff is we get bad news all the time. We get good news all the time. Um, bad news and good news taste differently depending where we are in the cycle, right? Like we got insanely bullish news all throughout the bear market and we got all kinds of bearish news all the way through every bull market. Um, but you had the whole yen and Bank of Japan thing happening. We had the weird thing where crypto decided it was going to hitch its future success bandwagon to a really weird uh, thing in the Trump campaign, which was really odd, I guess kind of RFK too, but obviously Trump has way more momentum. So that was a really weird move for crypto as a whole, but I totally get it. Like we're all desperate for public recognition. Um, alterations to the cycle, like we talked about, the fact that there's hot debate about whether or not we are in a recession or not, like tons of economists that I learn from and follow have very conflicting opinions about it, which is interesting. Usually you don't have quite that much division. And the best way that I've heard it phrased was that we are in and have been in for a while now, a hard labor recession, which is the, uh, the wage stagnation. You know, the cost of living is going up as it always does, but wages like the stagnation of people's wages, not increasing at all is being felt harder and harder and harder and harder as inflation, you know, ran away from us. Uh, and then you couple that with uh, all of the rate increases just made it even harder. So we're all still earning the exact same thing, but the cost of living has gone way up. So everything is more expensive, even though the jobs market is tech. Like think about the last jobs report, right? Like it was still over a hundred thousand jobs added, but it was looked at as being terrible just because of, you know, the number falling short of expectations. Well, the other thing too, is a lot of people have peeled back the onion on that. And the jobs growth that we've seen month over month has almost entirely been led by the federal government. Yeah, a lot of government jobs added, which always interests me because um, government the that was an interesting one. Uh, as a as a former federal government employee, um, we see like like right take take a look at like the jobs market right now and think like we're looking at government jobs being added as being a bearish signal. Meanwhile, the only groups like laying off people on mass are well, right now it's gaming studios. I'm like, they're firing everybody. Um, Bungie just again acts almost 20% of its workforce, which is insane after the most successful product launch in their history, which is insane. So like, I don't know why that was looked at as being bearish because the government's not laying anybody off. Um, can I, but, can I give you some more numbers for that? I finish your point. I'm sorry. Well, no, just I, you're talking no, about I, Will made a point a, a couple minutes ago about zooming out to like this period of quantitative easing that's really been going on. If you look at the last since Bitcoin has existed years since the 2008 financial crisis, we've really kind of been on an upward trajectory. But the last three or four years since the last bull run have been very different. And my theory that kind of aligns with both of you is that the numbers are diverging from the patterns we've seen that people cling to. This is why I've been hesitant to call what we're experiencing a bull market. Here are the numbers and what they look like. Um, in the last four years, I'm going to show you this graph that I think, Doug, was it you who posted this yesterday? It was fantastic. This is a visualization of Coinbase's quarterly trading volume in billions of dollars since Q3 of 2021. This was the top of the last bull run. The blue bar is retail dollars. The orange bar 
is institutional dollars just on Coinbase. But looking at the market broadly, this is a pretty accurate reflection of what the crypto market experienced, okay? And you can see the numbers are big. This is almost $600 billion. Look at the numbers as they go down to now. This is what people are calling the bull run. And historically, if you had looked back at previous runs, you would see bigger tops and higher lows also. So if this was a true bull run according to the four-year cycle, you would expect to see this number go up here eventually. Maybe it comes down, maybe it goes back up, I think is what people are waiting for. But I tend to agree with you, Will, because I think the other numbers, and Alex, this is to your point, don't reflect that we're following a, a trend necessarily. One of the numbers, Alex, is um, it like jobs, average income, this is just for the United States, has increased significantly, even in the last four to five years. But median household income, like the average person's take home, has actually gone down. So mm -hmm. billionaires have more money, companies have more money, right? And people like you and me, generally speaking, have less money. Oh, While yeah. simultaneously, though since like 2011, inflation has been pretty you know, good, we're in a good place. Wages have grown, we're in a good place. Since 2021, as wages have gone down, median household income, inflation has gone up. So your dollar doesn't go as far. And now we're getting information that uh, as the interest rates change, geopolitics happen. Um, people are spending less money on crypto. I, I, I'm really curious to, to see what happens, but my personal bet is, is kind of in both your camps that the numbers are telling us that uh, somebody said in the comments, retail is moving money or people are dumping uh, or institutions are going to buy up. I, I'm, I, I want to see bigger volume before I say, ah, yes, we are in a bull market. So something else I want to point out to somebody or to everybody is the next potential domino that could fall is is has to do with the fragility of the S&P 500 and the Nasdaq, right? Because because the stock market, a lot most stocks have been going down for the past year, but the stocks that have been going up. You have Google, you have your Amazon, you have your Tesla, you have like about seven stocks mm -hmm. that have really been mega mega. They're mega companies. Right. And they have been the ones really just seven of them that have been pulling the stock market forward over the past year. One of those companies is Google. And uh, someone in the comment section just reminded me of this. Google just lost a lawsuit. They are being broken up as a monopoly. Hmm. Did you guys wow. see that? Yeah, no, they, they've lost Google or Alphabet. Alphabet, Alphabet, which is bigger. Yeah. Bigger. The parent company of Google for people who don't know is Alphabet. Yeah, so Alphabet or Google lost a lawsuit where the U.S. federal court stated that they are a monopoly and acting unfairly with putting down and dismantling competitors. I think we are going to see a multi-month slide in Google. Google is one of the underpinning reasons as to why the stock market has gone up. If Google falls, that the, the, our stock market is already incredibly fragile right now. That could very well be the next domino that falls. Also, I did look up when the Bank, bank of Japan has their next meeting. It's uh, this Thursday. Hmm. So a lot of people are saying that they're going to make a quick change. Like it's not a. It, is that my understanding? It's not like a scheduled quarterly thing. This is like a a meeting they're convening to possibly call an audible. Uh, maybe because they're. They had meetings. Um, let's see. Oh, no, this is their summary of the opinion. So let's see. Outlook report. Do, 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 do. Oh, I guess their next meeting, their next big meeting isn't until September 19th. So this meeting that's happening on August 18th is a summary of their opinions. So we'll see what they have to say. Um, they also have a meeting. Yeah, the next big meeting for them is actually September 19th. My apologies, everyone, which lines up perfectly with the Fed's meeting on September 18th, the U.S. Federal Bank has a meeting on the 18th, um, where they'll most likely announce rate cuts. Um, so we'll see, we'll see what happens. Um, um, yeah, I wanna I mean, give right, it a- The big thing I wanted to highlight though was alphabets being broken up as a monopoly, because that's something that you'll yeah. read about in textbooks later. Yeah. You know? Um, can I give a shout out to Mashiste real quick to say, Mashiste, we definitely need you to come on the show again sometime soon when you're free to tell us about Basecamp. Uh, and we can make some little clips of that and get you some of that bounty money from, from our friends at Coinbase. But Mishiste made a really good point about zooming out on all of this that I forgot to add to the last bit about data, which is 
as you look at this over financialized depiction of what our space can be, what it is, it's important to remember that the total addressable market of blockchain, of crypto, is so much more than speculation. We, we were talking about this on Hussars Live yesterday. Your AI technology, your banking technology, but also like your food service, your supply chain, every industry is going to be innovated by technology where computers, smart contracts, code, replace people in jobs where a machine can do it better, freeing us to do other kinds of things and creating innovative, therefore unprecedented value. Crypto is a medium. It's going to be so much more than currency the way your smartphone does so much more than calls. And a lot of the, the value of it, though we're seeing it move right now, though it's just a very small percent of the world's like financial markets, a lot of the value of it is difficult to quantify with dollars and cents. So as you're panicking about this, like don't <laughs> let that be a gut check signal to you. Be smart about your money. Know if you're over leveraged or over invested. Get out if you got to. Uh, be prepared to pivot. But also, especially if you're new, understand that like you don't have to spend a lot of money. You don't have to gamble. Um, you don't have to be an investor to benefit from understanding like what this technology can be. And uh, in a marriage of those two things that seems unrelated, but I promise you is, especially for our show, Alex. Did you see that Charles Hoskinson was on YouTube calling for Cardano to go to a million dollars? So at that, you know. at that reference, I'm going to go grab my coffee because I need I need <laughs> I need legal drugs at this moment. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. I had to give it a little reset there. Okay. Uh, Did you have that on your bingo card? That's like the crypto panic meets crypto yeah, yeah. influencers shilling their own meme token but making uh, charles burger and if you ever want a top indicator <laughs> yeah. no listen to, i it it doesn't surprise me that doesn't surprise me at all like not even not even in the slightest um especially since we i i do love our our little actually i didn't do it today our little morning show tradition of just like looking at the trending crypto panic stories and trying to guess how many cardano references there are uh, any guesses? At least five. Over <laughs> under is five. <laughs> well, don't forget, it's only it's only seven stories that trend at a time. Um, and there there is a Cardano one, um, which is just trying to tell us that despite the market downturn, on chain activity is surging, which I find hard to believe. Um, yeah. Let me guess. So, people are unstaking. Yeah. Right. Hey, that's still activity, William. Activity. <laughs> yeah, everyone is selling. Uh, no, Evan, I think you made. I think you hit a really good point that is worth expanding a little bit. Just about like attempting to legitimately value these major crypto or any cryptocurrencies, which I think again, like I keep saying this, and guys, listen, to, please, for the love of God, listen to me. You can speculate on markets all day long. You can, you know, think about uh contributing macro or micro economic factors that can influence you know the ebb and flow of prices and all that sort of stuff and you can watch people who pretend they see dinosaurs in the charts uh call for ups and downs and sideways and whatevers but at the end of the day if you do not understand what the project is supposed to be and no one understands what the project is supposed to be there is no way to determine what its value should actually be Okay, like imagine a company going public and no one knows what they do. Imagine a company like going public. That's with... such a good point. Oh my God. Why well, have I never thought of that? <laughs> just, Honestly. Just, just imagine starting a meeting to like take your company public and you're like being asked questions by the go public people and like, okay, what do you do? Don't worry about it. Okay, no worries. No worries. Moving on. Um, what's your what's your current valuation? Uh, Four hundred billion dollars. Oh, okay, interesting. Um, why? Because, bro. Okay, cool. Yeah, good answer. Good answer. Good answer. And it's like, does any of that make any sense? Like, I made a video not too long ago. I should make it again. When you're evaluating a project to buy, imagine that the person who's shilling it to you was standing in front of the sharks, and they were asking all the standard questions that they ask startup founders on Shark Tank. Like, what face would Mark Cuban 
and Mr. Wonderful be making at that founder when they couldn't answer questions like, where does your revenue come from? Uh, and what do you do? Like, it's, it's insane to think about it that way. Uh, and that's almost every crypto. Like, so, Evan, yesterday, someone was m mentioning Fetch AI, and I've just like left it alone because it was all over the place. Um, it was all over the place uh, being talked about. There was so much like speculation being fomented in the market and the merge and then like merge FUD and like all this crap. And I'm like, you know what? I don't want anything to do with that. Like no one is even remotely questioning what the project even does for a living. They're just talking about like the token merging. So I'll skip it. But yesterday I just pulled up their website because I haven't looked at it in forever. Um, and Fetch is one of those cryptos that I did on Coinbase Learn and Earn like two years ago. Uh, and I had, you know, like 10 bucks that turned into a hundred bucks. Uh, and so I got rid of it. Um, and I'm looking at the website and dude, I, the, 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 the power with which I rolled my eyes into the back of my head, just on looking at the first, like the first banner on that website. Oh, right. Are you looking at it? Are you, do you see it now? Mr. Krabs? <laughs> <laughs> Like, you know, that's funny to me because I, I actually had a good conversation with our, our friend Robbie and um, he made it sound like they have a that like they have a product. And I feel like I remember looking and thinking Ugh, about their website, but the website is product, fine. The website isn't is the product clean. personal agents. Don't it's, they have that? I have no clue. I didn't even Don't make it. it that far because I got sidetracked with the your ultimate platform to build AI this AI that AI this. And I'm like, Jesus Christ. Give me a break. Oh, my God. You know, one, of, one of the nice things, every negative always has some kind of positive. If, if this is uh, the beginning of a major recession uh, dip in markets, maybe all the AI coins will be obliterated. And maybe I'll look going. fondly upon that smoldering, burning pile of garbage <laughs> and go, all right. Can we get something else to replace this now? Yes. That was the point that was the point that uh, came out of simplified yesterday was like, look, crypto is nuking. The point that I made, you know, in this in this, my little detailed chart, uh, the life cycle of a cryptocurrency, as you can see, step one, speculation, step two, actual user demand. OK, there are not very many that users are actually wanting to purchase because they need it. That was the real, that was such a turning point in my head to making the determination to purchase a cryptocurrency when I was like, I don't care what the price is. I don't care about investing this time. I just need a little bit of ETH. I just need a little bit of soul. Uh, I need to get a little bit of AVAX to do this, whatever. That was a turning point in my head where I was like, oh my God, I'm product shopping like an actual user who has like a thing that they want to do. And I need to buy this to do the thing I want. And I, that was the first time I had ever bought crypto that way, uh, like with that in mind, where I couldn't care less what the price is. I didn't even open a chart. I just like I needed 20 bucks of ETH. So I got 20 bucks of ETH, right? And did a thing. And gaming is just it. Gaming is that niche for me. This, this is my opinion. Full disclaimer, full disclosure. This is my opinion. But when I look at gaming, you have prices nuke, right? 60% across the board, standard for all coins. Bitcoin loses 30% in five days. Guess what didn't stop working? Games. Guess what has a way higher likelihood of stop to stop working is your weird Ponzi DeFi protocol that's farming you 19,000% APY paid out minutely. Like those things break when prices crater. We're worried about stable coins depegging. We're worried about all of these different things and I never have to worry about anything other than too many players crashing a game server. And so for that reason, if there's a crypto product that like I need to play a game that I like look forward to playing with my friends every day, that is the single most bullish thing I could think about a cryptocurrency right now. And, and it becomes a matter of time. Like you, they'll get nuked with the whole market, but like that's, that's where I care. That's my conviction right now. I can't believe I'm doing this, but uh, I don't want to get sidetracked into this, except to say, I think you might look at Fetch again. The docs page specifically well, is better than their home website. I don't hold this token. I have never purchased this token. I am not telling you to buy it. Uh, but I actually think their docs website, like fetch.ai slash docs, 
is way better than their homepage and it immediately tells me what their product is. However, my question remains as it always does. Does this actually need a crypto token? I think the product is awesome. I question whether or not the token uh, is anything other than speculative. You made money on the token, that's great, but why do I need it? God damn it. We were so close to disagreeing, Evan, you son of a bitch. Sorry, brother. <laughs> wait, oh, wait, I thought it happened. Did I, I just told everybody they finally disagreed, everyone. Did, did, did you, you came, oh. We came full no. circle. I, oh, I, I was too I, excited I, typing. I stopped listening after you're like, hang on, I think it's actually, I was like, oh shit, no. I, I do, I do actually disagree a little bit. So don't worry, it was not a total false alarm. I, I am so uninterested in, in that as a product because open AI exists. You can build GPTs and chat GPT 4.0 is incredible. I don't give two shits about fetch AI trying to like put a different color scheme and make the UI prettier. Like that to me, you have so little hope of using crypto dethroning someone like open AI. Like, uh, to be, to be fair in that, in that arena, right? Like Claude or Gemini, like they've taken good stabs. Like I've gone back and forth between using AI products, between stuff like that, just when like a new feature comes out. So like, I'm gonna cancel my GPT subscription and I'm gonna go back to Gemini Advanced and use that for a couple of months. Then 4.0 came out and I'm like, oh dude, 4.0 is wild. I'm gonna go back over there. Same thing with Mid Journey, right? Like I pay for Mid Journey. I love Mid Journey, use it all the time. Dali got better for a little bit. So I'm like, you know, I'm gonna go over, I'm gonna use Dali, I'm gonna use Stable Diffusion for a little bit. like. And guess what? Every single one of those did all of that without needing to sell me a cryptocurrency that doesn't actually have anything to do with the execution of their service. Mm -hmm. Where I draw the line. And and other things that I'll add just on the AI topic, everybody. So if you guys don't know, I spent seven years in the AI machine learning field, not as a data scientist. Can you? So I we've we've never gone, and I don't want to make you do like a full deep dive on your entire career, but like. That's such a broad space. Like, are you, do you, do you or your company, you know, do you focus on like kind of all of it or like, can you tell us like what's, what's more of the focus or like, what so do you I worked do? At I know you work in sales. Companies. So I worked okay. at three different companies. And the first one was a $3.3 billion company. The company's called SAS, S-A-S. They're the company that created analytics 50 years ago. In fact, the guy who created analytics, his name is Dr. Goodnight. He's still the CEO of the company. Uh, anyway. Um, you can use analytics. When I say analytics, AI machine learning are just analytical models. In the simplest form, you can call anything AI or machine learning if you have a model, just a, a bit of code that has some kind of system that creates a data loop that retrains the model after it causes whatever change it's trying to cause and has the ability to retrain itself. So that could be any number of things. It doesn't have to be like a robot or a self-driving car, right? It could be any number of things. As Alex said, it's super broad. So in my career, I first started working on marketing analytics. So using analytics to automatically personalize email messaging campaigns, cross-sell, upsell, tracking people on their mobile application to personalize marketing pushes to them on the app based on where they are in your store or your stadium. And I started uh, working mostly with casinos, hotels, and sports organizations. In fact, I moved to Boston because I worked with the Boston Bruins. Um, they were also, they're a lot of fun. They're really hard drinkers. They're great, um, unsurprisingly. Uh, and then I did that for two years. And then after um, two years of that, I moved to working with CPG companies. So think like your general mills, like, you know, they make cereals, they sell to Walmart. Think of, I, I worked with retailers, um, and I worked with, yeah, but largely CPG retailers and manufacturers. So a lot of that was supply chain optimization. What routes do I send my trucks? How do I have my trucks load up here? How do I um, tweak my manufacturing process to have the least amount of waste? This is one AI application there. Um, Alex, you have something to say? You just, not to derail you, just to interject a tiny bit, you just reminded me of a really cool uh, marriage of AI and blockchain in the real world that doesn't use cryptocurrency. Um, and I just, Evan, I know you've heard this story. One of my friends is a software engineer who works for U UPS. It's either UPS or FedEx. UPS. Mm -hmm. And he uh, he designed or is, is on the design team or the, the engineering team for their 
uh, their software that plans routes for package delivery based on like the most, you know, economic delivery of however many packages. So you can like put in a bunch of addresses and it does the calculation, whatever kind of thing, which they're using AI to do. And then also he is the person who taught me what blockchain is and he did it by building one uh, in front of me and then like walking me through how it all works and all that kind of stuff. And, uh, and he said that they, as a company, were interested in blockchain, not to use any tokens or any cryptos, but to exclusively generate new, uh, uh, new tracking numbers for parcels that would never be repeated, uh, yep. that could then be stored immutably on the ledger. They exclusively wanted it for number generation and data storage. And he was like, so yeah, I think this technology is really cool. I would definitely investigate it further. And that was like the thing that kicked me off uh, into crypto. So just a right. fun little aside there. Yeah, well, that's one great thing that like blockchain tech could be used for in like the shipping logistics side of things, because you can reduce the error of there being multiple different, uh, the same name for parcels. That's what you, something we, we, we call on the business as duplicates. Duplicates cause hundreds of millions of dollars in fines for organizations across the globe because it results in transactions being late or shipments not being full shipments and you get fined every single time for that so that blockchain can actually be a big boom but anyway Ed smith so the founder of fedex famously said in the 1970s that information about the package is as important as the package itself yeah Sorry. also fun fact fedex uses sats the company i worked at um and i didn't cover them but one of my best buddies did and also they're a nightmare to work with but they're actually a really well-run company. They just like hate their vendors, <laughs> which makes sense. You know, it kind of makes them a good company. So I did that. I worked there in SAS for four years and then I'll go through this quick guys. I'm sorry. No, you're good, brother. And then I went to H2O.ai, AI company based out in California startup. Um, but they have the largest amount of the term is Kaggle grandmaster data scientists. Um, there, there's this international AI competition called the Kaggle yeah. competition. Yeah. And if you win it multiple times, you then get the title of Grand Master. And Do you get like you, a hat? <laughs> no, you don't get a hat, but there should be. Um, and so H2O has the most Kaggle Grand Master data scientists in the world. And so I got to go into meetings with the literal number one ranked data scientists in the world for natural language processing and for three other categories of AI that I can't remember. So literally the top ranked data scientists in the world. I was bringing into Morgan Stanley. I was bringing into the Toronto Stock Exchange. And I was bringing into the national healthcare uh, solution for Canada. Um, and I mainly worked with financial institutions for the year and a half, two years I was there, um, working and also in the healthcare space. Uh, then I went to go work for a company that immediately got bought by Zebra Technology and fell apart. But that was demand forecasting where I got to sell to General Mills because I already had a relationship with them. And now I'm out of the AI space. But that's, that's my background. So all of that, very long explanation. But I have had the opportunity to work with some of the literal number one ranked data scientists in the world. I have worked with data scientists and I know the culture in and out. Um, and I know the implication in the use case and how things are put into deployment across a host of industries, some not regulated, some incredibly heavily regulated. And when I look at AI cryptocurrencies, I don't look at a single one, except for the um, decentralized infrastructure plays, like a render, because it's actually solving a real world problem of GPUs. There aren't a ton of them available. That's kind of been fixed, but they're still very expensive. So make it cheaper for people to get GPUs, to have computational power. I'm like, okay, cool. We'll see if anybody really uses it, but it is addressing a real world problem. But these AI plays, they're like, we've decentralized an area for people to build models and to make money from it. Um, no data scientist will adopt that in a large, meaningful way. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it has to do with the culture because there's already a huge open source culture in the data science space. And where you prove yourself and build up your credibility and build up your resume to then go to a company and say, hey, I want half a million dollars a year, is you have to go into these open source competitions. You have to post your code. You have to work on projects essentially for free to build out your resume to then go to organizations. And there are also tournaments you can win and get paid. Um, but data scientists are not going to further complicate the process of building models by having to get a wallet and by having to go to this ecosystem that like their model might never be used. Why would they go do that when they have this super rich open source environment 
where you already have the world's greatest data scientists building and collaborating with you. Why would you do that? Why would you, even if you could take that and put it into crypto, why would you add further areas or er, further, further barriers to entry for you to be able to experience that by complicating things with wallets and tokens and all that stuff when you already have this very easy to approach web to very rich, very large open source environment that is respected by um, companies who you ideally want to be hired by to make money. Web3 complicates that process and also puts you in a much smaller pool of people who are paying attention to your work, which is totally the opposite of what you want. Um, and so when I look at things like Fetch, where it's like, build your models here and it'll be monetized, I go like, okay, what are like three people gonna try to build models here? You know, that's the thing. It's, it's not everything that is on Web2 should be moved on chain um, until we get to the day and I think we're getting there with a thing like the Coinbase smart wallet um, to like make it so that your Web3 experience is the same as Web2, where all that stuff is pushed into the background. Um, if, if everyone can get on that, on that smart wallet and just get rid of the Web3 experience and all of a sudden you just have a Web2 experience, then now now we're talking right now. Now, maybe there's something here, um, but that's not widely adopted enough yet. Excellent takes. And I can't wait to have Andy on the show because Andy is in the comments having a robust discussion with you about the finer points of nuance in the, uh, the conversation. All I would add is that SaaS, the company, is missing a huge opportunity to sell stick on nails for the girlies because it's brat summer. I would, I would buy that. They need alpha. to get up to Gen Z and Gen Alpha. Like that's the play. I'll send an email, but I think they have zero interest. <laughs> That's fun staying think, poor, bro. <laughs> I don't think Dr. Goodnight, uh, Dr. Goodnight's one of the richest people in the world. I think he's okay. <laughs> well, I think know. he's fine. You know, you know. Um, and we don't have press on nails. Yeah, that's what Andy says. Um, so the points. One of the, um, one of the things that came up yesterday, if we're, if we're cool, kind of altering topics a little bit here. We cool. Um, that on the on the Twitter space that we talked about, I thought was a really interesting question because uh, I didn't immediately have something to say to it. Uh, someone asked with regards to kind of like what Will was talking about earlier. You know, like Larry thinks March towards uh, framing Bitcoin as a safe asset, and all of these companies and institutions that now have and are selling the Bitcoin spot ETFs, and now also Ethereum spot ETFs. Um, you know, the push towards, you know, that as a, a place to, to hedge money, all of these different things the more, the more heavily involved, uh, markets with regards to institutional buying and all that kind of stuff that we're seeing now. Two part question. One, is that good, bad, neutral, middle, you know, what's the take? And then two, does it walk us farther away from the core ethos of cryptocurrency uh, from its inception. And is that good, bad, neutral? And the frame of reference that they gave, which was actually a piece of Bitcoin history that I did not know, which is really interesting. Um, back in the day when Julian Assange was initially like facing all of his stuff, Satoshi was still active online and posting. And there was a move to fund Julian Assange's fight against the powers that be with Bitcoin because he was being cut off from traditional financial methods and, you know, accounts frozen, whatever. And Satoshi was actively campaigning against it, uh, not because he disagreed with Assange or whatever, but because he didn't want to see Bitcoin become the like, you know, the tool of Julian. Uh, or, you know, he thought that that would pull Bitcoin away from its original and like core ethos. And I would argue that Satoshi is a pretty solid person to have an opinion about that, uh, all things considered. So I didn't know that piece of Bitcoin history, but that was a really cool story that I tucked away. Uh, but I'm just curious what you guys think about those those questions. So institutional involvement, good, bad, neutral. Are we walking too far away from the ethos? Is that good, bad, neutral? Can I can I take it first, Will? Yeah, sure. 
I, I actually have a thought on this. Um, I've been considering this a lot lately because of the election. Um, there are a lot of takes in the political arena, and governments are certainly institutions in my book, about Bitcoin as a strategic reserve asset. It was part of Donald Trump's speech at the Bitcoin conference. Cynthia Loomis also made remarks about it, and so did Robert F. Kennedy. Well, and Cynthia Loomis also officially introduced legislation to make it happen, just for the record. Yeah, yeah. and I, I want to I tell you about their, their kind of plans and, and circle back to what I think about it. Um, there was a, a great conversation, once again, on the Unchained podcast with George Selgin, who is a representative at the Cato Institute, a conservative think tank, who sort of unpacked this idea of a strategic reserve. And his take was, it's, it's odd for governments, which are historically bad investors, to take taxpayer money and put it into what is really quite a very risky asset. And in terms of the ethos of Bitcoin, uh, the plans ranging from Loomis to Kennedy are conservative to extreme. On one end of the spectrum, uh, Loomis, I believe, says that we should stockpile Bitcoin, um, but it's a fairly small amount in terms of the broad percentage to give ourselves a seat at the table, um, a say in the network that is significant. Robert F. Kennedy's plan would see the United States accumulate 4 million Bitcoin. And the first point is there may not even be 4 million Bitcoin for sale. Um, obviously, everything's for sale if you're paying enough money. But that is for perspective. If you take into account the lost inaccessible Bitcoin, that is like 25% of the current minted supply. Could you imagine a world where an institution or a government owned 25% of Bitcoin? In my mind, that would, that would be a significant enough push for me as a deep believer in Bitcoin who buys it whether the market is up or down, to abandon it and look for another alternative. I already think Bitcoin is too centralized because you know Michael Saylor owns one in every 250 or whatever. That is a fraction of the amount. 25%, even the Trump proposal, which suggests that we would have around a million Bitcoin, that, that's still a significant enough percentage for someone like me to say, I got into crypto because I don't want to have a problem of a handful of elected people or appointed people controlling the money I use to get my groceries every day. I am interested in a permissionless, decentralized, global currency that is beyond censorability and permission. That in my mind, if we approach that, I think we're approaching that already with the Winklevi and the sailors of the world. It's already a concern for me. But if we got to that level of institutional involvement, that it was so dominated by any one or, or a few groups of people, that that would be, you always say, Alex, if Satoshi came back online and dumped or something, that would change your, your confidence in Bitcoin, that would shake you. That would be the kind of thing that would shake me. And I don't think it's hyper likely, but I think now more than ever, it is a real possibility and concern that prompts me to look at, you know, what other wheels can we invent? Is it time to look at a proof of work token like Caspa? Uh, where where would we, the people, go? You, you know what I mean? If if they took Bitcoin, that would be a serious concern for me. I I want to hear your thoughts, Will. But quick response, Evan, to to that point. The I'm gonna I'm gonna disagree with everyone. Ever, again, guys, mark market market on your bingo card two times in one show. <laughs> one and a half. One and a half. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll tell you why I might I might be reconsidering like so I did say it would shake me and I stand by that it would not shake me long term it would shake me short to medium term just because it would be such an upset however I think that if like if I was personally if I was Satoshi and this is so rich right um if I was Satoshi and I had the keys to that wallet like if if this is 100% genuine. You can believe me or not. If someone tomorrow sent me the keys to that wallet uh, and things like are as they are right now, I you could never move it because you would cripple the the ecosystem, right? Like I, you just know how many people would get hurt if you did that. If governments like the United States and you know the the cascade effect that the U.S. getting heavily involved in Bitcoin would probably have around the world. Uh, especially if you think about something like NATO uh, involvement, post-US involvement. I can imagine that that wallet 
would become mighty tempting to try to distribute more amongst citizens to like co-op some sort of massive you know like give to retail sort of movement to spread out and disseminate all of that bitcoin that would be a really interesting uh thought experiment um but i i think that if you so let's say hypothetically that happened governments get hardcore into bitcoin it becomes even more centralized than it already is you've got not just michael saylor michael saylor you know continues to own his one percent but the u.s government uh, acquires millions. It's worth noting, just for the record, again, I don't think any politicians ever consider this. No one says they just get to buy that much. Someone has to sell it to them. It's not right. unlikely that they would be able to get it because they could offer a premium. Uh, they could drive the price up and Lord knows they can afford it. Uh, but it's not a guarantee. And that's interesting. This is like the first thing that they've, as a government, have considered like, hey, we want. And it's not a guarantee that they can get it. Okay, that mm -hmm. is extremely powerful. Um, and two, I would say that, like I always say, crypto is cool because it's a permanent reset button that we can hit as many times as we want. And that's why it has power, not because one is better than the other, but because if one becomes corrupt, you can just make a new one and they can't stop you. And if Bitcoin became that, and like Evan said, we decided, well, shit, how about another one? Caspa, you're up next. Nothing, nothing says that in 50 years from now, governments wouldn't abandon Bitcoin in favor of Caspa if that's the way that the people moved. Because people move the world, governments don't move the world, governments attempt to co-opt and herd people to whatever. Um, that would be interesting. I would, I would not rule that out as a possibility. Again, long, long, long term. We're talking oh, wait, like- wait, where do you disagree with me? I just don't think that would shake my confidence at all. That wouldn't make me not like Bitcoin because I don't see that being a real scenario that, um, it wouldn't shake my confidence to see government like hyper. It wouldn't make me more excited about something else. If the government owned 25% of the Bitcoin supply, I'm, I'm saying if that happened, not yeah. will it happen, if it happened, would that shake your confidence? The reason that I'm going to say no is because one thing that I know to be sure is that governments act in their own best interest yeah. all the time. And they masquerade as something that acts in the interest and the will of the people. But we have been in the United States alone over the last couple of decades, just seeing categorically unpopular policy uh, and rulings and whatever be pushed through that the vast overwhelming majority of people in this country don't agree with. And they do it anyway. So, no, not really. I still don't understand. I'm sorry. Give me a give me a <laughs> give me a concise answer, man. No, you, no. You, you're not concerned about that. In a world where the government owns 25% of the Bitcoin supply, you're, you're getting up and going to work and buying Bitcoin? It, no, it, it, would be, it would be a concern, but not enough to where I'm like, I no longer have faith in the, in the network. Because I oh, don't so think they- You agree with me. You agree with me. I disagree with both of you. Okay, give it to me. Don't do a build me a buttercup like Alex just did. Build me up, build me a buttercup. Sorry. Um, but uh, yeah, I don't know where exactly to start on this. Um, I take disagree. Your time. So if the United States government were to equal its strategy with gold, and, which is it holds 19% of all gold supply across the world, um, let's say the US wants to copy that, which is what RFK Jr. wants to do. So we have, let's say America is able to get 19% of the total supply of, of Bitcoin over time. Um, I am not worried about that in part because I view it as an inevitability and whether or not America has that or you know BlackRock will have their hands on that or other nation governments will have very large supplies of Bitcoin. I'm not worried about that um, because it's not a proof of stake blockchain, it's a proof of work blockchain. I'm more worried about BlackRock owning 40% of the shares of six of the top largest, of the top nine largest Bitcoin mining companies. I'm more worried about that than I am about allocation of supply um, because the miners is where the control of the network is. <laughs> and ding, 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 ding. Yeah, exactly. So if, if it was Ethereum, yeah, I'd be like, oh, I'm not going to have my money in this because it's proof of stake. Um, we have a winner. <laughs> so yeah, I'm much more- this is a, That's a stellar point. Please keep yeah. going. So, so in, in the conversation of uh, token supply centralization for Bitcoin, I'm not concerned. Um, in fact, I viewed it as an inevitability because like, are we concerned with gold because America has 19% of the total supply? No, 
No, but it functions uh, differently. Like you say, the miners are facilitating sure. all the work on the network. It doesn't work that way for gold. Yeah, sure. But at the end of the day, like, why do you want people to have Bitcoin? You want people to have Bitcoin to have a means to escape the system, which you still can do no matter how much supply America has, right? You can't escape the system entirely because that's an impossibility. That is an unrealistic goal that is unachievable in society. I and disagree on both fronts. I know, I know, I know, I know, I know. You and I disagree on some philosophical things, but uh, I knew this is where we disagree. But it is, unless you really cut yourself off from the electric grid, go into the woods of Alaska, you know, that's the only way that you can really get away from, you know, the rat race that is life. But so long as there are people with huge amounts of money, power and influence, those the tendrils of that will always get into very altruistically created things hence bitcoin now does that mean that just because those tendrils get into it that bitcoin the ability to help people to save people to help you from inflation to give you the ability to do remittance payments is uh faster and more control of yours and away from a lot of these kind of like middlemen money schemes absolutely not that's still available a ton of the benefits that are there. If you want to escape from fiat currency inflation, going into Bitcoin, a, a intentionally unintentionally unintentionally deflationary system because people lose their Bitcoin, that's still not changing, right? So the reason that you go into Bitcoin, those two reasons, control over your own finances, the ability to have cheaper, faster international payments, and the ability to save yourself from inflation of the dollar and the printing of the federal government, those reasons are all still totally there. So supply allocation, a huge amount of it, amount of it in the hands of the government for Bitcoin and a proof of work blockchain, no concern at all. If BlackRock starts getting 51% market share in Bitcoin miners, now I'm concerned. However, you could take that to court and break that up legally because you would say that BlackRock would have a, a, a monopolistic control over the, the industry. Um, which could be broken up, but that would be something that would take time. Um, and that's something that BlackRock most likely wouldn't do, which is why they're happy with having 40% market share in Bitcoin mining companies, which is a strategy that they have done across a slew of industries. Um, so because of that, I am worried about the miners. Am that's I worried a seriously enough to the point where BlackRock would shoot themselves in the foot by getting too greedy with them? No, because BlackRock's smart. But but I'm not worried about token supply centralization. It's an interesting thought experiment because if you if we stick with like the gold mining versus Bitcoin mining comparison, there's some like really important nuance that immediately pops into my head as far as you know controlling infrastructure for acquisition of the asset, gold versus Bitcoin. And like gold mining, right? Like if we were hyper concerned that someone owned too much of the gold mines and then too much of the stockpile. There's not really room for a new little country or a coalition of countries rather to be like, we're going to stand up to this superpower and just start mining more gold in our own country. But that is in the realm of theoretical possibility when we talk about Bitcoin mining, because you can do it anywhere in the world uh, mm -hmm. if, if they can, you know, so in this scenario, you know, the United States, we're getting kind of out there, I know, but the United States has a tremendous amount of the Bitcoin mining interest, whether that's here or just owned somewhere else. Uh, and then like a ton of other countries are like, you know what, we're not cool with this. We're going to form some sort of coalition, you know, BRICS-esque, NATO-esque, but a different coalition of nations and just start acquiring uh, mining infrastructure and setting up our own, you know, network of, of mines and then have it all work together or whatever. Uh, the more you add, it directly impacts the ability of our stockpile or BlackRock stockpile of miners to be able to function, which is not even remotely the way that it would work if someone else just opened up a new gold mine in a different country. It wouldn't change the amount of gold available in the mine that we have access to. Uh, but, you know, a, a 2000 fold increase in the number of miners worldwide would absolutely change the efficacy of American miners. No, but here's the other thing is like Will said, because we live in a capital system and because the incentive is to accumulate capital, especially for people who have power and want to maintain it, you've created a game of cat and mouse. We would flee to a new gold mine that we created and they would follow.
and they would come in. So the the really the only solution to that game is to change the values that give life to the tools. Like it starts with values, scarcity, competition. So we create money. It's limited, scarce. It's the only way to get your groceries. You got to work for it. And we we give it to you, right? So unless and until you can change the values underneath, you can't give life to new different tools. You will always be recycling and creating systems that I mean, there, there's also, especially if they, especially if they own the miners, there's absolutely nothing to stop them from saying, you know, what would be great is if we just remove the cap, we, we, unlike gold, they can say, you know, this 21 million thing ain't going to cut it. And so, you know, unless and until we change the capital incentive, they'll continue to be moved to use the power they have more than us. Yeah. To, to follow and do that. If you want to talk about the single thing that would make me irreparably lose faith in the network, uh, it would be that, just for the record. Yeah, yeah, it would be increasing the, the total supply. Um, but then again, like, in order to be a store of value, you need, you know, comparing Bitcoin to gold. The most important thing, and, I, and I've, I've written blogs on this, um, I've published an article on it, and uh, I've made videos on this about the reasons as to why Bitcoin can be considered a store of value. The number one reason is trust. That's the number one reason. People trust gold. People trust silver. Have for thousands of years. People trust Bitcoin because it doesn't change. A lot of people are complain about Bitcoin. They're like, oh, it's not as fast as stable coins or XRP or blah, 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 blah. Right? Pick your coin. It's faster and cheaper. Why would anybody use this? And I was like, well, because the most important thing for store of value is trust. And... The powers that be know that. BlackRock knows that. BlackRock is have heavily invested in it. I would be shocked if we ever find ourselves in a situation where the government uh, and the United States Empire, which you know will be able to push its thumb and apply some pressure on Bitcoin mining and on the global financial system because you know they would own a bunch of Bitcoin, um, would push for that change because it would be against their interests and would cause the trust to fall out from Bitcoin. You know, that would be something they'd want to protect. Also, I do just want to update everybody. Yes. The markets, the markets did open 16 minutes ago, and Google's looking rough. The S&P 500 started to go upwards, and Google has just broken the, um, what am I looking at here, the 200 uh, exponential moving average on the daily time frame. And it's looking like a potential scary red candle as we get fallout from uh, their lawsuit loss. Dang, that's a big domino. Yeah, that's a big domino. Big. Although the S and P five hundred is not down too too bad today, but we'll see. Google Google could bring everything down with it if it breaks this two hundred day. Let me take this opportunity to remind you a couple of things. Let, this this is a deep conversation. If you are new. Um, if you're just trying to learn about cryptocurrency, you're trying to get a picture of the markets, hey, you're in the right place. We're sorry we talk a lot of inside baseball because we've been here for a while, but we're like just everyday people who are curious about this stuff and have learned about it because we spent some time here. If you are, are curious and want to learn, then come hang out with us. We're here live Monday through Thursday, 7 a.m. Central Standard Time. Live on TikTok, it goes to YouTube if you miss an episode, so you can stream that. We have a free newsletter uh, that has become more irregular lately, but is you know a, a semi-regular occurrence with the best bits, briefest links, all the, the good tips and tricks from our show if you can't tune in all the time. And we got the Discord community. It's totally free to join. Come hang out with us. Ask us a question. The show lives there 24-7. And speaking of the show, all of us, we have one account. This is where we live on TikTok. This is me, this is Alex, this is Will. We will never DM you. We don't have backup accounts. We, 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 don't, we, we don't do that because there are many impersonators in this space. So the best way you can protect yourself if you want to learn with us is to follow these accounts uh, and, and then we'll, you'll know it's, it's the real McCoy. And then jump in the Discord because that is the easiest, best place to send a message that says, hey, Evan. Uh, got a friend request from Conversations with Evan, number one, two, three, four, five. Is that you? No, it's not me. Or to ask, hey, uh, can you slow down and explain Bitcoin? That's the place to do it. And you can find all the links for all that stuff in our profile bios and also at the riseupmorningshow.com. The riseupmorningshow.com, just like our show, super simple, super easy. And don't forget, We've got our first official sponsor. I wish I had my soundboard to do a beep, 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 uh, banana gun. 
They are a trading bot that is bridging to Solana. They were on Ethereum. That's where they made their name. Now they're on Solana. You don't have to spend any money to use the referral link in our Discord. Alex, thanks for posting it fresh. It's right there in the general chat. Sign up and start using it today. It's one of those crypto companies that has an actual product that you can use that will make your time here better, especially while you learn. Uh, it's a simple, safe way to hold crypto, execute trades right from a text messaging interface. It's very cool. We'll be doing more content about it and we're doing a giveaway for people who refer and then post a picture like their proof of referral. I'll open a separate channel for it, but just put it wherever. Um, we're going to put you in a drawing to win 50 bucks. You can have some money sent right to your banana bot account that you can start trading with and uh, it'll be a lot of fun. We'll have more content, a little tutorial, a little walkthrough. We'll do a short form. We'll do a long form, um, but show them some love so that they know how much we appreciate them and so that they keep sponsoring us because we want to build good relationships with our sponsors. And now? Yeah, every, every, every single sign up makes us look good. Like if, if we are being full frontal about this, uh, every single one makes us look good. <laughs> I love the full frontal. Dang, Alex, it's, uh, it's the morning somewhere. <laughs> Amen, brother. <laughs> Which means it's five o'clock somewhere, I'm sure. <laughs> so... I, if, I was going to say if there's any, uh, if there's any questions, if there's anything that you maybe jumped into the show in the middle of that you missed the beginning of that you want a recap on anything like that, we kind of hit a bunch of stuff today. And I personally really, really, these are my favorite conversations, like the high, yeah. high level, more like theoretical. Yeah. Today's conversations has been like one of my favorite that we've had. Yeah. We've had like some great topics. Personally. And I'm like awake. I'm jazzed. I hope everyone watching knows that this is the valuable stuff too. Like I love that we didn't have a lot of, should I buy this? Should I sell that? Like I love that everyone's paying attention. And also Alex, you said this yesterday. I love that people are mostly pretty chill right now, even though there's a lot of red. No, I was. Well, I don't know. You should go into the comment section of my video where I told everybody I moved to state. <laughs> that shit's not calm. People are it's so invested calm. in your arrow. They're bags. so angry. <laughs> They're so angry. <laughs> I, I, yeah, no, that will your. I when I saw that video go up, dude, I was like, this is this is a brave man. Like, protect him at all costs because you just don't see that kind of open. Like, Will's not stupid. Will knew exactly how that video was going to be received the moment he sent it. And not only did he send it, he posted like 16 others. So, like, that, do not, do not underappreciate the value of someone who makes videos like that. Um, you know who else made videos like that that got a lot of hate and people literally said he fell off because he made it? And I'm sitting over here thinking, like, no, dude, this is one of the few is um uh oh my god evan what's his name virtual bacon oh yeah oh yes yeah 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 i like his stuff virtual bacon has like just calm level-headed analysis he does make some price targets and stuff like that but like he posted a thing once because he had conviction and a thought process and he had a plan and he followed it and he sold some stuff and it turned out to be a bottom and people still to this day if you ask what they think about virtual bacon, they will talk shit about him. And I'm just like, holy shit, you guys are so like you are, you have missed the point so egregiously. It's not even funny. Yeah, He's personally my favorite. I'm going to do air quotes around this newer YouTuber, you know, um, from this cycle from which now like about like nine or 10 months ago, I started subscribing to him. Cause I saw his videos and I was like, no, oh, these breakdowns are phenomenal. Yeah. You know? Mac, Mac will tell you too, that he's a big virtual bacon fan. And I mean, we, I, He's one of the few that I didn't purge from my from my following list. Um, the I, Evan, to your point, just to just to echo the sentiment a little bit because I'm super appreciative as well. Uh, it says a lot to me. A couple different things about like this this group, and this was one of the points that came up on Simplified, the Twitter space that I did yesterday. Was um, Sam at the end of it was just like, it's so cool that we have like you know the markets crumbling around us and everyone here is just like level-headed and kind of chill and like doing the right thing it really to me it says that people at least who are here with us are starting to put like legitimate plans in place and being prepared for either way someone was asking me earlier like you know what are you preparing for i was like dude i have absolutely no clue where the market's going to go and what that means is that i have some I have like a good chunk in stable coins that are ready for the most horrific downturn of all time. And I also have stuff uh, that's still in assets that I have high conviction in. 
in case we go up, I, I want to have some profits that I can sell and take. So I'm prepared for both because I have no clue what the hell is going to happen. And they were like, oh, yeah, play both sides. Makes sense. And I'm just seeing more and more of that coming out of the chat. And I know that because there's not just like fervent panic in the comments, which is so that makes me feel so good and so warm and fuzzy inside. I love it a lot. Yeah. Um, and then two, someone else was talking to me about just like the political nature of crypto right now, given that like it's becoming more of a main stage issue and you've got prominent politicians on both sides of the aisle coming out with like strong opinions for or against, you know, party affiliation starting to change, whatever. And, you know, people being really upset that like now it's getting too political and whatever. And I'm like, dude, I know for a fact that our audience has more than one time Trump voters. We have like far left leaning individuals we have. And somehow, somehow we've created an environment where those people can just like talk about the issue, the thing that we care about, which in this case, crypto policy as it pertains to U.S. regulation uh, and not bicker and fight with each other the whole time. And it just takes me back to like when I was an undergrad and me and all my friends would go out and you'd have like a a hearty debate, Democrat versus Republican on X, Y, Z at dinner. And then you would go back to the dorms and everyone would play Call of Duty or something and have a beer. <laughs> and it's just like, you know, that that's a cool a cool discourse that doesn't really get to exist anymore. But it happens at this show, which I love dearly. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm just very grateful because now we finally leverage us into our getting our first sponsorship, which is wild after 20 months. Um, but you know, first, not last. And, uh, I'm just super stoked that I get to do this every day with you guys. So, yeah. And it's, it's cool. Cause I mean, I haven't really thought about it like that, but yeah, it's been like a safe space for like everybody from different backgrounds to come together instead of bickering on like Twitter and yelling at each other. We're all like, oh yeah, right. We all kind of want the same things, <laughs> financial independence, security, safety for our families, all that stuff. And like, we all kind of view this as a way to, to help that. It's also been crazy seeing like the numbers of the lives continue to increase over the past. Like, I don't know when, when I, when I joined, I think we were getting like 50 or like 60 and, and now we're at 198 right now. And Alex, you and I were in a live for like an hour and a half in like the afternoon or like the morning. It was Evan, you weren't able to hop on and like, at least cause I wasn't there at like 200 to 250. <laughs> yeah, it's cause Evan wasn't there. <laughs> Well, people see your luscious hair and they feel bad about theirs and they, they run off. <laughs> they run off to the store to get the highest end shampoo and conditioner they can find. Yeah, now, we're working on that shampoo sponsorship. Um, I was going to say, dude, the next the next sponsor is just for the record. Pantene Parker? and Willby Parker. Like, <laughs> we've got to get Will a pair of glasses, guys. I, okay, no, one day I will have glasses, but no, we need I need a Guinness sponsorship. I have been making, I have been putting Guinness into my videos, just hoping that like somebody sees it, but also because I love Guinness. That's what I need. But, um, just yeah, send us your sponsors, off. people. I need to hop off a few minutes early, uh, to okay. just get some things up for a call I have at 10. You want to give us a final thought? Good joke, wisdom, word of opinion, quick one on the way out? Um, two things. One, investing. Being perfectly right is impossible. If you're ever perfectly right, you buy the bottom, you buy the top, you're lucky. Um, or you have insider information. Um, the goal is to not be, is to not build your strategy around being absolutely perfect. The goal is to build your strategy around being mostly right. And when you're wrong, as, as few or as little wrong as you possibly can be, that's how you make money in this market. So be comfortable knowing that you're not going to sell the top most likely, but try to do your best being near it. You're not always going to buy the bottom but try to build a strategy to being near it. And one of the ways that you're able to do that is A, build a strategy for yourself, get connected, learn from people, but also do not leave, do not stop paying attention to the market. Something that Alex talked about a few days ago. You're gonna want to, if, if crypto collapses and markets collapse with it, you're gonna wanna not pay attention to it at all. Don't do that. Pay attention to it. Maybe take your money out potentially, but don't stop paying attention. Look to see who's still building, who's still getting use who's still in the space and keep your eyes on the market so that when you start to see signals flashing that it's time to buy, you might not buy the bottom perfectly, you can buy near it. And if you're able to do that, you make money in this market and you're able to leave bull runs with a little bit more net worth than you had before. 
And then over time, compounding interest turns that small money into very large money over time. So that's the last thing I wanted to say. Best of luck, everybody. Always fun chatting with you here, guys. Uh, love you all. Um, have a great day. Make a bunch of money. Bye for now, Will. Thanks for being here. What a guy. Um, I see you having this conversation with Crypto61, and as we invite everyone else to give their last thoughts, good jokes, words of wisdom, I wonder if you would just expound on that a little, because I wanted to talk to them too. Crypto61, we're glad you're here, but uh, Alex, what's your advice? Just, and this is for anybody probably asking, should I buy yeah. right now? Or feeling the pain, feeling confusion, yeah. feeling uncertainty. I would say that if you are unsure whether you should buy or sell right now, you should probably do nothing. Um, at least right now, like don't, don't make the knee jerk reaction. Cause that's the, the reaction that you'll regret more likely than not. Uh, just to echo Will's point, this was a conversation we had the other day. I, I know for a fact, I know, cause I see, um, views on videos that are like educational in nature or whatever, just absolutely gutter, um, when things remain suppressed price wise for a long time. Uh, there's a big, there's a big jump in video views and engagement right as the crash happens because everyone wants the buy or sell signal, um, and if they don't get it, they leave. I am telling you, from years of personal experience and years of lessons learned very painfully, do not let that be you. The reason that we just axed thirty to seventy percent off of everything over the last four or five days. And I am still in profit on every single position I have is because I didn't leave. And I was just putting not even much like, uh, uh, you know, not even regularly, not every month, um, often 50 bucks, hundred bucks at a time, you know, like whatever I could spare into stuff just for several years, all through the bear. And now I'm like up on every position, have the, privilege to like take profit on stuff even when we're down that's why this is the first time in the market cycle that that has ever been the case for me and it's because i spent the entire how long was it from november of 2021 that the last crash started until november of 2023 like two entire years just reading and observing and adding and building conviction and creating a portfolio that was small and conservative, but like that I had a lot of faith in and it worked out. And now that we're here, like I keep saying, every time the market goes green, I sell something. Every time it goes red, I, I don't buy something every time, but every time it goes red, that's when I'm like, okay, how do I feel about this position, that position, that position? Do I wanna add something to this, that, this? Do I feel like I have too much exposure to this? Do I feel like this thing can't come back? That's when I sit down and like do an evaluation and gut check and like make sure that, okay, I'm still cool with everything. If not, identify the mistake, change it, don't make it again, but never, ever, ever leave. Like, and that's not to say don't like turn off the screen and like don't look at the portfolio for a couple of days. I just mean, don't, don't walk away from it. Don't like stop intaking information because you learn the most valuable stuff, the stuff that is going to pay off. You're gonna, you're gonna learn that in the times like if this is a bear market, you're going to start learning it now. And no one will ever be able to take that away from you. The next time this comes around, uh, you're going to be like one of those seasoned pros that's like, I've been through this before. This doesn't rattle me. Um, you know, because you've, you've now built, you've now built that armor, armor. <laughs> that is required. Yeah, so, dude, that's dropping it. wisdom. And, and here's the other thing that I would add is we're always talking about the discord, which we made free to join on purpose because the best way to learn this is by getting around people whose experience you can absorb. It is hard to build conviction about crypto because some of it, none of it is special in the sense that you got to be a techie or a finance nerd to understand. We're, we're totally regular guys. Um, Alex and I are not super early. We're not super smart. We are very good looking. but. The reason that we are here and enthusiastic, feeling good and you know doing well is because we have spent time and benefited from the time others have spent. When you, when you get in a room full of people who are talking about this stuff, some of them know a little more, some of them know a little less, some of them know a little different, then you accelerate your learning journey. And it's all about conviction. The reason Alex's portfolio is small is because he's only got 24 hours in a day. 
we used to spend our time trying to be early, trying to research everything, trying to buy a little piece of all the stuff because we just didn't know. Now, we've seen enough to know a little better. And we're managing our attention first. We're looking at fundamentals. And we're not just investing our capital. Like, here's the thing. If I, if I could say something that Alex does really well and that I think I do really well as an investor is um, we build relationships with people. And we are able, therefore, to hear good takes, bad takes, get to know which ones are bad takes, and spend more time listening to the good takes. We're on Warpcast trying to build relationships with people who are at the center of our industry building real products because that's how you get in early. It's not some telegram group where you hope you saw the TikTok that you're going to gamble on later where someone told you to buy this. It's because you talked to a founder and then another founder and then another founder and then another founder or you talked to someone that you know, like, and trust who did and you, you, you have enough experience to say, oh, this crypto has a real product, a real service, a real token that is going to solve a real world need for somebody. No problem. I'm here first, of course. Thank you for asking me to to participate in your beta program. Six months later, you get airdropped a bunch of tokens. Wow, they might be worth something. Even if they're not, the knowledge you gain from that investment of attention, instead of chasing a thousand tokens, researching a thousand websites, that is worth so much more because it helps you to qualify other stuff. So if you don't know whether you should buy or sell, do nothing. Spend time learning, building relationships, building community. Do it somewhere free where the only thing folks are going to try to sell you is uh, a course where you can maybe learn a little live or a coffee mug like us, <laughs> you know? It doesn't have to be us, but we have tried to make the best community with as much free information, experience, and knowledge as possible. The paid stuff just helps us scale. And mostly we're trying to get paid by sponsors. So, you know, joining the community helps us do that. Evan, I, I meant to ask uh, when Will was here, but I was considering taking um, a few bucks of the Banana Gun sponsorship money and finally boosting the server to level three so that we can get the custom invite link so that we can stop doing this like invite direction oh. through bio links and stuff and just like give a URL. Dude, that's probably worth it, honestly. That, okay. that would be great. If yeah, it could match it. the URL of the show, like, you know, the rise up morning show.com discord.gg slash the rise up morning show would be. That's, that's, kind of what I'm, that's kind of what I'm thinking. So, um, I'll, I'll keep you guys posted because it, it might be more economical to spread that between the three of us and have each of us upgrade. Cause right now, if I add more boosts, I think it's going to be more expensive than you guys like adding a few more to whatever you have. Cause I have shitload. <laughs> Um, but we, Alex is we, a power we, user. <laughs> we can check. No, uh, for real. My uh, Discord is stacked. You, I pay. I pay a lot of money every year for Discord. <laughs> um, let me let me address one more thing. Crypto sixty one says because I want to make sure they specifically can get in the Discord. Um, stick yeah. around with this Crypto sixty one. Write that down. The Rise Up Morning Show dot com. It's got a link. There are links in my bio and Alex's bio. We should continue this conversation because I don't want to see you or any of you get. Uh, burned, hurt, etc. Um, we will teach you anything we know. We'll admit when we don't know. Um, and we'll really focus on the fundamentals. Sure, we could teach you how to do leverage trading if you want to know. I don't think it's a good idea for most people, including myself, to be trading leverage. You should know enough about it to make your own decision. Um, <laughs> uh, Alex, is it okay with you if we make a couple of rapid fire question answers? Um, yes. And then yes. take our dogs and ponies and get on the road? Um, one more time, it's the rise up morning show.com. Take your time, go over to the discord. If you don't get it, follow us here, send us a message. We will help you get in totally free to join. And that's where the referral link for banana gun is. We want to look good to our first sponsor. You don't have to have any money to sign up and you could win some money if you post your proof of it in the channel. Um, so go take care of that. We'll talk about it more all this week. First question, what is leverage trading? Leverage trading is when you do what all those investors were doing with the, the Japanese interest rates. When you take borrowed money to make a bigger bet, some exchanges, some trading platforms will allow you to take your dollar and make a riskier bet in order to use some of their money. What they're trying to do is get your dollar. Um, I might go to a platform like KuCoin, which is a trading platform, a platform like Webull, and say, hey, I have a dollar, and I would like to bet on the future price of Bitcoin. I think it's going to go to $100,000 by the end of the year. If they think that is particularly likely, they'll say, okay, great. We're going to give you a couple bucks to add to your bet. If they think there's no way in hell that's going to happen, they'll say, here, here's the $1,000. Go ahead, use it. And if you win your bet 
the less likely that bet is, the more you stand to win, the more leverage they allow you to take. The bigger your lever gets, you're betting not just with $1. If it's 10x leverage, now you're betting with $10. If it's 1,000x leverage, you're betting with $1,000 for the cost of your $1. If you win, you get to keep it. But on the other side, the bigger the leverage, the less likely your win is. And if it hits a certain number instead, like you're betting on the future price to go up and it goes down a certain amount, they just take your dollar. And so it, it is a setup where the casino is more likely to win. You are likely to lose the money you give them. Um, but if you have a lot of conviction, you know some something's going to happen. It, it can be a it can be a way to gamble that for some people uh, is fun and profitable. Most people who leverage trade lose their money, but it's good to learn about. Yeah, Alex. Uh, the only other rapid fire question I saw. I know you're perusing. Is I'll be very quick on this one. What is BlackRock? What do they do? BlackRock is a global asset managed company. They offer um, financial advisory, risk management, and also they have like instruments you can invest in, like the BlackRock whatever fund, green energy fund. It's a basket of stocks, ETFs, that in one place you can click a button and send money to. Um, it's like an investing done for you. They take a cut. <laughs> the, the, is that Tony? That's pancake. That's pancake. pancake. Who's Tony? Right. Where'd Tony go? Is Tony? Am I? Am I forgetting? Am I uh, totally off I'm, with my dog? Tony was a dog like over a year ago. You're very, you're very behind the curve on on my. Did Tony look like pancake? Huh? I knew you had a lot, a lot of Chihuahua. You were, you were Chihuahua deep. A heavy bag yes. of Chihuahuas. Yes. Chihuahua Maxi. You diversified a little. <laughs> a little bit, yeah. I'm, I'm exclusively split into pit bulls and Chihuahuas. <laughs> is there is there is there leverage trading can you go to the rescue and uh take out leverage and get like a thousand x dogs <laughs> i mean yeah you come by the rescue i'll give you a thousand dogs for sure but no 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 leverage just just piss in my kitchen <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah 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 uh cosmic says when rise up morning show calendar with y'all holding your dogs honestly we i have a feeling we could sell a lot of calendars if we uh did weird if will dressed up in costumes we held dogs and um if we put our hair down and and maybe for the month of may my birthday month i'll take my shirt off i bet we could sell i bet you can show everybody all your tattoos man we from the right crowd we might make some money man i mean we're there for Cosmic. the puppy be clear do we have enough dogs to fill up a whole calendar yes absolutely absolutely many calendars i could you could, could do a dog today with, with yeah if we, if we use the rescue we could fill 10 years of calendar without running out of dogs um, are you seeing any other questions in the chat? I'm posting a last link for a YouTube nope, handle. I was going to say, um, but I'm, I'm well met. I know we got to yeah, find us, find us in discord. If you have any outstanding questions, we can carry on the conversation over there. Um, I've got a few, a few videos to film. Um, I've got some banana gun bot experimentation to do so that I can give you guys a more accurate report. Um, last call. If you, if you haven't, uh, signed up for it. The link is in the general chat on our, um, in the server. And I think we can throw it into the, uh, we can throw it into the, the beacons page too. Evan, I don't know if you've managed to do that already, uh, or if we can do that today, which one, the, the beacons for the show. Yes. Wait, well, but what the banana gun? Yeah. Yeah. It's there. Okay. Banana gun is there. So, so, yeah, okay. so the place to go is the Discord or the RiseUpMorningShow.com. It's got the YouTube, the newsletter, the banana gun referral link. It's got everything. Uh, do you have to use Telegram? Yes, for now. However, uh, one of the other things that they are featuring, which is not currently live, I don't know the date. I can, I'll, I'll text and see if they have a, a tentative release date for the web app, but they're moving to a web app, so you won't have to use Telegram for it, but you'll still get to do all the stuff. If you're just joining... My final farewell, uh, Type Surge, good to see you. We got our first official sponsor, which is extremely exciting. Uh, Evan and I were reminiscing on 20 months of doing the show without earning a single penny uh, from any advertisers, despite the fact that every single episode, at least once we say this isn't sponsored, but it should be. Uh, we got sponsored by a Telegram trading bot company called Banana Gun. They were on ETH. They bridged over and added Solana, and they're doing a huge marketing push to get people using the bot um, on Solana. I, Evan and I both 
love using Telegram bots just because they make your life so much easier if you're trying to gamble in the meme coin casino. And um, this one just has a couple features that I've never personally seen in one. So it was exciting. Uh, so a friend of mine is running the marketing campaign for them. She reached out and asked if we would be interested. Pitch was good, said yes. They paid us, which is awesome. And they gave us a referral link so everyone can sign up. It's it's free to use. You know, you supply it with as much Solana as you would like to supply it with, um, but you don't have to buy or sell anything you don't want to. There's no token to shill. There's It's just a service that you can use to buy meme coins a little bit more safely. Um, and it's safe to use because you you hold your keys. A lot of yeah. these, yeah. There, there are a lot of dubious bots, but a lot of our favorite bots like Bonk or Photon or yeah. now Banana Gun, you, you have your, it creates a wallet for you that you hold the keys to. So when you want to send that money somewhere else, done. It's, they, they take a small percentage, you know, that's how they make their money. Um, but I think it's very reasonable and, and I, I wouldn't have any concerns personally, unless you are using it to do risky things like, you yeah. know, ape yeah. into a honeypot. Yeah. Oh, but you know, what's really cool, Evan, Tell uh, me. one of the features, this is, this sounds like a staged scripted bit, but it's not, I just genuinely forgot to tell you. Um, <laughs> Someone was asking me earlier, uh, why would I use this over BonkBot? And I was like, no, fair and valid question because I needed, I needed a reason to switch from Bonk to this. The biggest reason was speed. It's 10 times faster. Uh, but this is the coolest. This is why I want to be their spokesperson because I don't think I've ever seen this in a bot before. They have a built-in honeypot checker. If you try to buy a token and it's a honeypot, the bot will simulate a transaction first, and if it can't do it, it will flag it as a honeypot and block you from buying it. What? How cool is that? Where has that been? Why oh. is that not a thing? Wow. How sick is that? For real, though. Like, but also, how simple. So, because we always give the okay. same, like, you know, line item of steps when you're trying to buy something. Like, we always say, go sniff the token, right? I love to, I love sniffing tokens. We talk about it all the time. <laughs> this thing will sniff the tokens with you. So I recommend sniffing. I still recommend. I always recommend sniffing. Yeah, still but sniff. You got an, another layer of protection in this thing, and that is that is so damn cool. The second I read, it's like, why is that not like the headline feature? Um, like, sure, yeah, copy like trading is cool. Limit orders is cool, uh, but a built-in honeypot scanner is so cool. Dang. Anyway, that's the Holy that's shit. the commercial. I love it. I'm so glad. If I leave, if I leave one thing in the crypto space, it's that we all start sniffing tokens. Because, uh, guys, I'm telling I'm telling you, almost all these things are trash. You gotta sniff them. If it smells like shit, it is. You gotta sniff it first. Can you imagine if somebody just scrolled onto a live on the for you page talking about <laughs> sniffing tokens with banana gun? If that's the only thing you heard from me is me being really excited about sniffing stuff, then yeah, yeah. Uh, concern. If you're still here through that, then you're my kind of people. And on that note, you can find us every day, Monday through Thursday at 7 a.m. Central Standard Time right here on TikTok. I invite your friends, invite your mom, whether you're old, young, red or blue, black or white. We are happy to have you here to help you understand what is crypto? Why does it matter? Why might you get involved? Or even if you never do, uh, what it's going to do to make the world, we believe, a better place and help all of us write a better future to rise up. Jump in the Discord. Find all the links at theriseupmorningshow.com. Thank you, everybody, for being the best part of our show. Thank you, Alex, for a great conversation. And until next time, my friends, rise up. <laughs>